Uh, just a reminder, and the um, the day will be recorded and made publicly available, uh, and uh, we'll also email attendees and everyone that registered so that will get copies of of the recording, and it'll also be posted on the Swift website. Um, so, without further ado, I will, assuming everything is working technically correct at the moment, uh, I will introduce our first. Uh, presentation today and we have four leading into uh, the the first hour uh, and our first one is Bujbim World Heritage Cultural Landscape and uh, we've got Aaron Rose and Ben Church from the Quidditch Mirroring Traditional Owners Aboriginal Corporation. Welcome Aaron and Ben. Thanks Peter. Hello everyone. Um, I'll maybe start with the introduction, Ben, and then we'll get jump into the presentation. Um, so I'm Erin Rose, I'm Gunditch Mara myself. Um, I'm the Budge Bin World Heritage Executive Officer at Gunditch Mirroring. Um, and I um, well, probably should also acknowledge that I'm um, meeting from Gunditch Mara country here today, um, and I pay respects to elders past and present. Um, I will quickly hand over to Ben Church, who will be co-presenting with me today to talk a little bit about the, the um, Bajbim cultural landscape. The, we'll have a look at the World Heritage side of things, but also Ben can talk to um, Caring for Country and some of them programs that we use or do or deliver. Ben. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thanks, Ez. Um, yeah, thanks, uh, Peter and everyone else for the invite. Um, yeah, Ben Church is my name. Um, like Erin, uh, Gunditch Mara, um, proud Gunditch Mara man. Um, currently um, team leader with the Budgerim Rangers um, and our, our, our programs operated through the Windermara Aboriginal Corporation. So um, yeah, that's kind of me. Very good. I'll start sharing. We've got a presentation. Um, Today and I'm just going to try my skills to use it. Hmm. I don't think that's worked. Oh, it says loading presentation. We've been it's having a bit of a delay <laughs> with presentations. It'll show up. Yep, there we go. All we good. had a, um, a Microsoft update this morning and it's changed um, the PowerPoint, so it threw me a little bit. Can you see that in full version? Because I'm, yeah, I think I'm seeing something a little bit different here. No, we can see that oh, all now. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, uh, talk about the Budge Bin uh, cultural landscape, um, myself and Ben. Um, the uh, Budge Bin cultural landscape is um, World Heritage protected. Um, we received um, uh, World Heritage in July 2019. Um, we went over to Azerbaijan um, uh, when it was inscribed, so it was a pretty special moment for all of us. Um, well, the ones that were able to attend and the ones that were watching from back home, um, it was a, a pretty, um, yeah, it was a pretty big moment for us, I think. Um, the Budge Bim cultural landscape is one of the oldest aquaculture systems. Um, it's highly sophisticated and engineered system made by Gunaj Mara um, using um, using uh, the lava flow um, uh, and manipulating the systems and stuff like that to create an aquaculture system, um, which I think is pretty amazing. It dates back past 6,600 years ago, um, pretty amazing um, with no technology back then and just understanding, um, I guess, country and, and knowing a lot about how it, how it works. Um, so it's, it's pretty unique. Uh, it still flows today, it's still in, in full function today. Uh, this is an aerial view, um, just to give a bit of it. This is a, a small part of the aquaculture system. Um, it's quite a large area um, that it, it goes across. Um, but here, I don't know if you can see my pointer. Can you see me pointing anyone? No? Oh, usually I've got a pointer with the other. Anyway. Um, this is a great aerial view. You'll see to the, um, I guess, the bottom left of, of the picture, there's some, some sinkholes there. So they're um, uh, good for um, holding kuyang in there. Um, they were able to use weirs and, and stuff like that to keep them in there and, and manage the water flows. Um, the, the, there's a channel right up the centre of that. 
Um, and then the, on the, the right hand side of the picture is the lake, so the main water, the Lake Condor or Tayrak, which is the main um, water source um, for the aquaculture system. Um, and then on the other side is the, the, weir, the weir that we constructed, um, I think, in around 2010, um, which is still a main water supply for Kalara um, and for the system. Um, so, yeah, it's pretty cool. And that's just, yeah, as I said, one little picture, um, one big picture that shows a, a good um, idea of what the aquaculture system looks like, but its function is, is fairly large. A little about the World Heritage Journey. Um, so as you can see, it started in 1989 um, when we first proposed um, TARAC um, for World Heritage. Um, we sort of knew um, a little about it um, and thought, you know, it, it would be good to have it protected. Um, work continued in 2002. We got the Lake Condor Sustainable that would develop the Lake Condor Sustainable Development Plan um, and listed World Heritage as, as an objective in that. Um, from 2002 through to 2015, which is, is a long time, a lot of relevant research and lobbying that went on. Um, and in 2017, the Budbeam um, Cultural Landscape was listed on Australia's um, World Heritage tentative list. Um, and then in 2019, um, it was inscribed. Uh, so it's a lot of work has gone um, into us being able to get World Heritage. It, it took a lot of, um, as you can see from 2002 to 2015, just the amount of research and evidence and stuff like that that you need to go through the process. It's really quite um, significant. Um, so yeah, it's a great, it's a great achievement, but it's always, it's really important to, um, and also we've always cared for country. Um, so yeah. Um, Next one, this is just an idea around some of the challenges that we did face. Um, so the Foreign Minister, Julie Bishop, in 2014 um, said that um, we have 19 precious World Heritage Sites, the 11th highest number in um, any nation in the world, which is remarkable for a nation without millennia-old built history. Um, so again, it just it wasn't an easy process um, going through World Heritage, but then in 2016, Dennis Rose, who must have been around MacArthur at the time, um, the Bajbin Wabafo contains an excellent example of the world's oldest aquaculture system, which is at least 6,600 years old. So it's, um, yeah, it, as I said, it, it's, it was hard work to get there, but it, it was definitely worthwhile. Um, continuing connections to country um, was recognised through native title um, in 2007. Um, There's with continuous connection to culture, and that's really important um, part of of um, um, of the process. But just in more broadly, just having access to country and being able to um, practice um, is yeah extremely important for us. And it's important that we look after country to do so. Um, the World Heritage um, at the during the inscription in July um, 2019, um, we had some really good feedback from um, other um, countries that were uh, present at the um, at the forum. And Spain was very pleased with the nomination. It's got it all. Um, Hungary. We now have an example of a perfectly managed site and excellent and effective management system in place, which. I think we can always do uh, better, but I think it's really good feedback to um, show some of the support that we've got and, and it highlights some of the good work that we are doing to improve country um, and to look after and protect country. Um, and having World Heritage, I think, has supported that a lot more. Um, community control, uh, cultural obligation around caring for countries is, is extremely important, but also it's really important that Gwinnish Mara at the centre of, of all of the work that we do and why we're doing it. Um, so I think, um, yeah, we've, we've always maintained control, especially throughout the World Heritage process, but throughout a lot of the other work that we do, we've worked hard. Um, so we need to also be able to enjoy and connect to country. So um, we need a healthy country to do that. Um, I think it's time to pass over to Ben to talk a little bit. Um, we've got, oh, I can, I'll talk to this one quickly, Ben. We've got a, a number of um, management plans um, that sort of oversees the management of the Budgeman Cultural Landscape. We've got three 
uh, different um, property managers across the, the landscape, across the three areas. So we've got Tirandara IPA, which is um, owned and managed by Windamara. Um, we've got Nungunich Nungumara, which is a more of a partnership plan, um, which uh, looks um, looks after the Bajbim National Park um, and a lot of the works that we do in partnership with um, with a lot of our agencies. But in particular, we've got the Bajbim Council um, and Parks Victoria who co-manage Bajbim National Park. Um, and then we've got the IPA plan of management, so Gunnish Mering, um, own and manage a number of properties across the Bajbim cultural landscape, um, such as uh, Lake Conda, um, uh, Curtnage, um, Alambi, Lake Gorry, hopefully some of these names are familiar to you. Um, uh, so Gunnage Mirroring look after them properties and we've got a management plan that oversees that management. So yeah, I'll pass over to Ben who can talk about the Bajbim Ranger program. Yeah. Thanks. Um, thanks, Ez. I'll, I'll try to keep, keep it quick. Always hard to um, cram everything in. Um, but um, yeah, so, so again, I'm, I'm one of the team leaders with the Budget and Rangers. Um, so yeah, the, the Ranger program, um, as yeah, it was established back in 2006. Um, so we, um, I guess, you know, the Ranger program is always been a key key component um of the the arrangements for the management of um yeah conservation and um yeah protection of the the, the budget landscape the, the, the you know, world heritage landscape um so we're, we're we're funded um by australian australian government through um through its indigenous protected areas um program um and and again is is managed through Windermara Aboriginal Corporation. Um, so we employ um, yeah, full-time and, and trainee rangers. Um, we also have two mentors um, part-time. So um, they're really a key key component to to our program. They, they provide us all with um, you know that cultural and um well cultural knowledge and and support along the way so um it's daily having having those two uh mentors um so really our, our, our rangers um you know responsible for the um the management of the budge beam um and tier and dara protected areas um so we, we have quite a quite a um quite a wide range of responsibilities um so management activities include um, native flora and fauna management, um, yeah, infrastructure, building and maintaining walking tracks, um, upkeep of infrastructure, um, yeah, pest animal and, and weed management. So um, yeah, the, the, the common rabbits, foxes, um, deers and, um, most recently pigs, which I'll talk a little bit um, in a minute. Um, and we also also run tours. So through the Budgeroom Tours, um, yeah, we, we provide and facilitate um, guided tours um, around the tier and our IPA and, and, and the other IPAs. Um, so really our, our program, um, as I said, you know, it's, it's it, Always, you know, it's it's a, it's a key. We have a key role in ensuring the the cultural continuity um, and and ongoing transmission of traditional and contemporary um, goodness, Mara knowledge um, and and practices across um, well across the generations. So, um, I might go to the next slide if I can, please, Sarah. Yeah. I think I can control it from here. So, um, yeah, it's a bit of this photo of um, or four of our rangers, um, or four of those guys who <laughs> have moved on. Um, yeah, we, we lost or well, didn't lose, but have, um, yeah, a few of our rangers have, have moved on to onto other employment, which is yeah, a great outcome for the for the program. Um, but yeah, this this shot here was um, down just the um, at the Lake Condomission, we had some um, 
they're quite extensive. Uh, well, we still have quite extensive willow um, um, issues down down on Darlitz Creek or Kalara. Um, so yeah, we 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 help these guys out um, over a few days. Um, so yeah, weed management is a is a yeah, pretty big part of our program. Um, yeah, mainly willows and um, yeah uh, thistles and yeah all the the popular ones out of, out of the country. Um, Training is a big part of our our program, so we put um, all of all of our ranger team through um, chemical user um, um, course, chainsaw course, tractor. Um, also ATV, so yeah, training's a, a major component of our, our program, so. Um, and just to, to probably to highlight, um, this is a great example too of lots of our partnerships. Um, so we have a lot of partners, um, partner agencies that we do work with, so like Glenel Copcom CMA, um, I think who we partnered with on this one, um, wasn't it, Ben? Um, yeah. We do a lot of work with DELP around um, uh, fire management and pest control work. So that we've sort of got lots of parks big. Um, we work pretty closely, really closely with them. Um, it, lots of probably very common agencies that we all work together. Um, we've, we've got some really good supportive partnerships um, to assist a lot of the work that we do do. Sorry, Ben, I just thought I'd yes. chuck that in there. Ben and Aaron, um, just a quick heads up. Um, yeah. We've still got another five minutes. I haven't got any questions in the chat, so I'm happy to keep going, Ben, for another yeah. another five or so. Um, yeah. And, uh, yeah. yeah, we can answer questions offline if that works. Thanks. Yeah, sure. No worries. Yeah. Thanks, Is. Um, yeah, so water water restoration. Um, yeah, being, being part of, yeah, uh, a number of um, water restoration projects. Um, so yeah, obviously um, through I guess recent, relatively recent hydrological um, alterations of wetlands across the Budgerim landscape, um, you know, have, have clearly impacted on on our ability as traditional owners to um, yeah I don't know access water and and undertake our um, you know our important cultural cultural practices. So um, I guess full or part, you know. At least partial restoration um, of the hydrology of our wetland systems um, is, yeah, has been a, uh, I guess, a major um, objective of, of us as Gunditch Mara. So um, the success, I guess, the success of, of our approach to um, water restoration has been um, demonstrated. And, and Aaron mentioned um, at the start the um, the re re-establishment or re-flooding of Lake Conda. Um, so the construction of the weir out there to block, um, yeah, you know, a European um, drainage channel um, out at Lake Conda, um, which, yeah, uh, was completed back in 2010. Um, you know, that, that, those works has really resulted in, um, yeah, partial restoration of, um, of the former lake um, water level regimes, um, and and as 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 also partially reactivated, um, is the flow through our our aquaculture um, system. So um, these works, you know, culturally really important for us, but you know they also contribute to um, protecting and restoring the it's the ecological health of, of country and wetlands um, and, and other waterways in the area. So, um, yeah, the, the projects, again, so touch on the um, the partnerships, which we're, we're pretty proud of. Um, you know, we really value those partnerships and um, these projects have been led um, particularly by, again, the Glenel Copkin CMA um, and, and Gunditch, Gunditch Mara, Gunditch Mering. Um, so yeah, pretty pretty cool um, cool projects um, and uh, the major sites um, you know, comprising um, the Budgetbeam World Heritage Landscape. Um, again, Erin touched on um, you know these places. Um, yeah, previously had um, permanent or near permanent water supply and and abundant food sources um, that 
that traditionally would support um, fairly big, uh, a big mob. So um, I might, I've got a little bit more to say on that, but I might just jump to the next one of oh, that water restoration um, space. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, but yeah, just quickly, yeah, cultural burns, obviously, um, you know, uh, the cultural fire is, is, is big on, big on our agenda at the moment. And as, as you know, we've always had, um, you know, big aspirations to, to reintroduce fire into, um, into our landscape and, um, through our Wienyakin, um, strategy, um, you know, we're really, you know, we're, starting to um i guess develop guidelines around um uh, restoring cultural fire back into into gundishmara country so um yeah the purpose of 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 our cultural you know our cultural fire um through traditional and led practices across um all types of our country um you know enables us as 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 tas to heal country and um you know, also to fulfil our rights and our obligations as, you know, as, as Gundich Mara. So, um, again, to touch on the, the partnerships, um, traditional owners and, and budroom rangers, um, you know, have, you know, have have led our burns um, um, on our LPAs. So, um, yeah, those those partnerships um, obviously really important. Um, have I got time to talk about the feral animals? Uh... <laughs> Do we, Peter? Yeah, we Qu quickly, Ben. Yeah, yeah if you can. Just sorry, I'm, I just we won't go to questions, but um, yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll keep moving. But yeah, quickly on pigs. Yeah, no worries. Um, so yeah, at the moment, uh, quite a quite a major um, concern through the the budroom landscape is um, is feral pigs. Um, so yeah, again, through um, Gundich Mearing and our ranging program and. And of course, with Delt, where we're um, um, particularly at our Curtinage IPA site, where we've um, yeah we've collected a, a lot of data, and um, we seem to have quite a big population of feral pigs on that IPA, which obviously is a is a big concern for us. So um, yeah, between the three groups, we um, we're trapping out there um, with, as you can see on the on the photo there. Um, through pig traps, which we can, um, yeah, get some live feedback, and we're able to trap, um, um, trap them live. So, um, yeah, obviously that's ongoing works, and um, yeah, but but is is a major concern at the moment. Mm. And a big concern the impacts they could have on cultural heritage, but also too, there's another side of it: that pigs carry diseases, and the impacts they may have to waterways and stuff like that too. So. It's um, a pretty key program that we are fairly focused on at the moment. And we are, we did just recently get some funding so we can do some better monitoring. Um, so hopefully we can build some more data that might be available for the region um, to sort of see the scale of the problem, which I think will be really important. I'll oh, quickly, um, we've just got two more, one more slide, or two more slides, Peter, but it's on LIDAR. Um, this is just an example of some new technology um, uh, that we've started to use LIDAR. I'm not sure if people are, are familiar with it, um, but just to give an, a, a bit of an example, LIDAR um, sort of basically takes back the, the vegetation um, and you will see on the, in the photo of the left, that's LIDAR imagery and the one's just a, a, a typical aerial shoot. Um, and you'll see a channel, um, I wish I could have, I had a pointer, but you can see a sort of a channel in that green section through the middle um, which I think is about 160 metres long. Without LIDAR, we didn't know that it was there. And then you look at the, the same same shot at the, the photo on the side that the um, with the vegetation, uh, we wouldn't have been able to see the trap. So it's really been really good for us to sort of uh, rediscover where some of our cultural heritage sites are, but also to how we can continue to build on the aquaculture system um, because we, we do know a lot, but there's still, as you can see, there's a lot more um, that, that we are rediscovering and, and continue to keep learning about. Um, so yeah, and we're, we're working with Melbourne Uni on a partnership to advance some of that work also. Um, but that, that's it, and I know we've probably run out of question time, sorry. That's all right. Look, um, it's been great hearing from you both. Thanks, um, both Erin. Um, uh, and Ben, I uh, really appreciate your time uh, for presenting. As I say, sorry to 
to wind wind you up. You you we could talk probably for the whole day. Actually, it's such a fascinating subject. So um, we'll give you a, a round of applause. Thank you for talking. There is a question there. Um, uh, you might be able to um, just put into the chat offline. Um, it's just from um, Elia says, how how is attaining the heritage listing contributed to Budgebim's tourist visitation research opportunities or access to funding? Um, probably not a, that straightforward one to answer. I could give you quickly 20 seconds on that if you had a quick answer or you can type it into the chat. Yeah, I'm happy to quickly touch on it. Um, yeah, we, um, we get in World Heritage listing. Um, we had uh, just a, a instant um, a level of interest um, for tourism opportunities down here from mainly the general public. Um, so we're just seeing a, a massive increase um, to support the to supporting um, tourism. We've we've had some recently or some newly built um, infrastructure for better visitor access um, on the IPAs. Um, so that's sort of how we're um, supporting that increased interest. Uh, research opportunities. Um, before we had World Heritage, we always had a lot of interest, but definitely after, um, people feel very um, privileged to be able to work with us. So people are coming up with some great ideas. Um, Greenwich Mirroring have got some principles around research that we sort of want to make sure we're doing research, we're doing it uh, to benefit and support us. Access to funding. Uh, COVID's made the world a little bit different anyway, so it's, it's probably not um, the easiest spot to say that we did. Um, we, we definitely have had more support around some more positions, I think, to support us as a World Heritage Site, but they're never long lasting. So. Thanks very much. Thanks again to both of you. Uh, we appreciate your time and um, for being part of the forum today. Um, now I'll throw over to um, our next presentation to uh, Marta Ferenzi from BirdLife Australia. Marta's going to talk to us around site action planning for important migratory shorebird habitat in Good Ditch Mearing country. Uh, welcome Marta and I'll throw it to you. Thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for the presentation, Erin and Ben. I really enjoyed it and I was lucky enough to meet uh, the Butchbin Rangers in the field and go for a shorebird adventure together uh, a few months ago. Um, and I hope we can uh, do that again in the close future. I'm just about to share um, my presentation. Okay, it's opening, it's probably taking a little bit of time. In the meantime, while the presentation is uploading, I would like to acknowledge that I'm giving this presentation today from the lands of the Wadawurring traditional owners. And I also would like to acknowledge the Gundij Mirin country that we are discussing um, today. I can see that the presentation is still uploading, so hopefully. I think it's just connecting now, Mara. Yep, you're good to go. Yes, okay, You can you see it in full screen? Yep, we can see it yep. now. Okay, great, fantastic. Thank you for the introduction as well. So my name is Marta Ferenci and I work like a bird life Australia in the migratory, uh, migratory shorebirds team. And my main focus in the team is to develop um, my, uh, migratory shorebird habitat side action plans for um, areas that have a lot of threats and issues. And I will talk a little bit about migratory shorebirds as well, as I'm not sure who are in the audience, just to give you an idea of what migratory shorebirds are and why it is really important to look after them and what our role is in protecting uh, these precious uh, birds. So migratory shorebirds, I'm, I'm pretty sure that all of you heard of shorebirds, that we have a lot of resident uh, shorebirds here in Australia that live on our shores all year around. They breed here, like for example, the hooded plover, but we also have um, other uh, species of shorebirds, uh, exactly 37 species that migrate to Australia who are migratory and they are not here all year around. They spend the summertime here um, and otherwise they would go and, and uh, migrate all the way to Siberia where the, they breathe. 
So they are really are usually called the migratory shorebirds as uh, superheroes because their mig migration is really incredible that these tiny birds can migrate uh, tens of thousands of kilometers, which is um, really impressive. So if you have a look at this slide, I just give you a, a little bit of summary of what these birds do so you uh, have an understanding uh, what migratory shorebirds do within a year. If you have a look at that little animation on the right, uh, those little yellow dots are um, uh, uh, actually birds that uh, we had uh, e extracted the uh, GPS tracking from. And then you can see how they migrate all the way from Australia to Siberia, where they would breed and um, uh, or they would breed in Siberia, north of China, and also some species in Alaska during June and July. So it's usually only six weeks that the birds spend um, in the Arctic, so they really have to be really quick. And then uh, after that, uh, they migrate through the East Asian, Australasian flyway all the way to Australia. So they do stop over at different staging sites. Um, well, Erin was also talking about the word heritage. So, for example, the Yellow Sea is a, a famous one, which is a really important bottleneck for uh, migratory shorebirds. But there's also other sites where the birds um, uh, would uh, stop over. But of course, sometimes these birds uh, can fly. Uh, 6,000 kilometers in one go, so that's really incredible uh, how long these uh, uh, birds are able to fly. And then uh, they would migrate to south and they uh, spend uh, time in Australia uh, for about six months. Um, so the question is, why is it uh, important? We, we often get this question from people because especially shorebirds, people don't meet, they don't see in their gardens, they don't even know that they exist. And why is it important that we want to protect these birds? I have to mention that most of those species, most of the migratory shorebird species that migrate to Australia are uh, endangered or threatened. And how we look at their declines, uh, it's pretty obvious that if we don't do something, they're going to go extinct uh, uh, in a few years. So uh, uh, me and my team worked out uh, like a slogan that we are all struck by the migration of shorebirds and want to protect and conserve this phenomenon for our future gen generations. And I think it's really important. And I think I did uh, have a chat about that with the woodwind rangers as well, that how, how they see uh, uh, the seasonal migration in, in, uh, of these birds and how it is important to see this cycle and be part of this cycle. And I think um, uh, Australia's role uh, and our role is to provide all that habitat that the birds come here from all the way from Siberia. Uh, and then we would like to provide a really peaceful habitat where their birds are appreciated and can feed and rest before they're taking on their long migration. And of course, um, it's it's a very complex task uh, to do. There's a lot of issues here in Australia. There is habitat destruction. There is human disturbance that we have to deal with. There is a lot of introduced predators, as again we heard from the previous presentation. There's a lot of issues uh, and introduced invasive species as well. So there's we, there's a lot of uh, issues with um, vegetation encroachment and uh, of course introduced predators uh, that we uh, see every day that they do affect the habitat of migratory shorebirds. As well. So what we are working working towards to that we would want to provide a peaceful a roosting site and also um, a site that there is dense food sources available um, uh, for these birds. And that's why we um, we worked out uh, a new tool, which is the side action planning, because of course we here we are talking about the global issue, the global issue of these species that they have to uh, travel through half of the world. Uh, this is their life cycle, but we also need to think about how we can uh, protect these species locally. What is that that we can uh, do here in Australia or in our local area uh, to help the, the species to survive? Now, before I go into the details about side action planning, I wanted to um, um, uh, talk about a little bit about um, the Australian National Directory of Important Migratory Shorebird Habitat. So we already have a pretty good knowledge what these uh, sites are where these birds are in Australia. So we have a really good volunteer system uh, and uh, we collect data. We have a, a massive database. So we actually uh, already keep track of um, the whereabouts of these birds and also the population dynamics of these birds. 
And uh, of course, to understand what these birds do or whether they're uh, declining or well, which is the case for most of the species, of course, we have to know uh, more about them. So this directory that we put together and actually just been published identifies all the sites in Australia based on inter international or national criteria using significant thresholds, which means for each species, we have a threshold that says um, if there is enough numbers of that species at that site, that is an internationally important site or, or, or a nationally important site. So we have all those uh, uh, sites listed in this directory. So if interested, I will share um, the link as well where you can access the directory. So we already know that there's a lot of sites. So if you have a look at this map, there we have more than uh, 151 um, internationally important sites in Australia, so that you can see that uh, there's a lot of um, birds using this habitat in Australia, and there's also uh, more, more than 200 nationally important sites. And if you have a look at this map, and then those little numbers there on the map, they're all important habitat for migratory shorebirds. So today uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the Gundich Marine area, that there's also quite a lot of um, really important habitat for these shorebirds that we would like to uh, protect. Uh, I, I um uh, there's a few sites that we're working on in the area, but there are uh, two that I would like to highlight uh, are the Hamilton Lakes and uh, the Discovery Bay. Both are internationally important migratory shorebird habitat, and we've been working on those sites in the last couple of years and uh, just recently developed um, migratory shorebird habitat site action plans for those sites. Some of you maybe are, who are here in the meeting today participated in some of the stakeholders meetings or may also came to one of our community events. Um, so the Hamilton, the lakes around Hamilton, uh, they are also listed in the directory of important wetlands. There is 10 count areas. So there's within the shorebird habitat, we have count areas where we uh, keep track of the, the birds. So uh, we do the monitoring. And then we have Discovery Bay, which is listed uh, as a Ramsar site. It's also listed in the Director of Important Wetlands uh, and also a key biodiversity area and also listed in the Flyweight Network site. So you can see that there's uh, sites which are uh, really important internationally uh, as well. Um, so the side action planning. What what are what is what are the side action plans? So if I would like to talk a little bit about that. So the side action plans' goal is to target key sites and their com uh, and their communities, um, and also identify the threats and key management needs for the area for the migratory shorebirds and their habitat, and also fine tune existing management plans. So sometimes the issue is that we do have uh, management plans for for some sites, but uh, it's, it can be a really bit problematic um, that how all those uh, actions in the, in the management plans are implemented. Um, and um, of course, these uh, side action plans have to list strategies and fast, uh, fast track high impact actions that we would like to see um, um, at a local level. And of course, the really important thing is that it, although it's a local issue that we would like to establish a long term sustainable local ownership. Uh, of these plans. So if you go to this just uh, this graph, it's just uh, show us how we go through the side action planning process that we've started to do at Hamilton Lakes and Discovery Bay as well. So first we have the assessments that I already talked about that we target key sites for side action planning that meet the assessment criteria for an international or national significance, but also we assess the threats that we have to uh, pay attention for, and we also look for local communities who we can uh, work together with. And the second phase of the side action planning is the engagement. When we engage with the local stakeholders at key sites, um, uh, we run workshops and ident to identify the local requirements for migratory shorebirds. So we've been doing that in the last couple of years as well for uh, these two sites. And um, we also identify the objectives um, 
what we would like to uh, implement uh, in the side action plan. So if you have if you have a look at uh, in the side action plans for uh, Discovery Bay or Hamilton Lakes, you will find the objectives discussed around the monitoring uh, of the migratory shorebird populations, uh, uh, discussing all the threats or how we can maintain and protect the key habitat values and how we can uh, develop fast track management responses to deal with the issues and that side at those sites and of course also discussing the how we can increase communication education and participation and awareness uh, programs at these sites um well so far uh, uh, we have now for for hamilton lakes and discovery Bay the uh, published site action plans uh, and we are at that stage now so we identify the threats we liaise with the stakeholders we run a couple of workshops uh, we also have some community events and we also planning some more uh, implementation focused um, uh, uh, stakeholders workshops and also there's a, a couple of uh, community events are coming up as well for example there will be one next uh, Friday on the 3rd of December in Portland the shorebird ID workshop or a volunteer upskilling workshop that I will run uh, with my colleague uh, Dan Lee so it's if you're interested you should come to that um, and uh, of course, if you have a look at again our side action planning process, the next one is the implementation. So the implementation is the key what we would like to move towards. So we have all the ideas, we identify the, the actions that we would like to take. But now the next uh, really important phase is how we can implement them. And of course, one of the key uh, here is funding um, uh, for uh, this and then, of course, if we can move towards in the side action planning process for the monitoring, it's really important that how, how we, we, we will see that how the site is doing, if the actions that we implemented, if they have an effect on the shorebird population. So it's really important that we monitor um, uh, at these sites in the coming years. And, uh, and the last uh, part of the side action planning process is the revision that we are planning to do in every five years. So we have the plans and then see how we uh, uh, going in the five years and then and then again we would revise and think over what would be the next step um, uh, protecting the migratory shorebird habitat at these sites. So uh, I see that Peter's video is on this probably means that my time is up. Uh, so this is really just my last slide. Um, what, as you could see on that map at the beginning, that we have so many sites around Australia. So, the, but I think the only way uh, to to um, protect this shorebird habitat is uh, that we really empower a local community. We identify the threats, the each issues locally, and we look after our own really important shorebird habitat. And then, if we can do that, then hopefully from one by one, looking after the little dots we can improve uh, the situation of migratory shorebird and uh, shorebirds and their habitat so the side action plans can play a really important role in achieving the achieving our vision also in Gundij marine country so we get started with two sites that are going well and hopefully we can extend that to other sites as well if we can work together and um, see a positive outcome uh, for migratory shorebirds Thank you very much. I would like to uh, acknowledge also our partners who funded uh, the site action planning uh, program in the country. And um, thank you for your attention. And I'm very happy to take uh, uh, questions as well. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks very much, Marla. We appreciate uh, your presentation and it was uh, fascinating and you got through a lot of information. So well done. Um, we have actually hit time, uh, so we are going to have to move on, but I don't see any questions directly in the chat or the Q&A. Um, but if people do have any, can they put them in? Marta's happy to answer them between now and she's got to leave after morning tea break. So if you've got any burning questions, put them in and Marta's happy to answer them. Uh, and also, if you do have any questions that you have along through the chat, try and get it in early so that I can see it and if I've got time with the presenters I'll ask them that um, before they leave us. So um, thank you again Marta and um, uh, I'll now throw to Jacinta Hendricks. Uh, Jacinta is going to be talking to us around bitten recovery and coastal connections. Um, Jacinta is from the Glenelg Hopkins CMA uh, and the floor is yours Jacinta.
there we are. Um, yes, so thank you everyone. My name is Jacinta Hendricks and I'm speaking to you from Greenwich Marine Country. I'm in, based in Hamilton and I work as a senior biodiversity officer for the Glen Alcockin CMA. And today I just wanted to share some, um, some findings uh, about my project with you. Uh, and especially um, having a give, it, I've given it a bit of a focus on the theme that emerged um, during my reporting, my recent reporting, which was really all about connections. So I've called it Bitten Recovery and Coastal Connections. Um, like I said, I'm speaking to you from Gunditj Mirin Country. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which I work and live. And um, I especially want to acknowledge the ongoing connection of traditional owners to their country. Right. I'm trying to, there you go. <laughs> trying to get to my next slide was a little bit hard. Um, so my Coastal Connections project um, was funded under the National Land Care Program. I've got a lot of delivery partners, um, BirdLife, Nature Glen Elk Trust, um, DELP, ESMR, Gunditj Mearing, traditional owners. It's a five year uh, program. So we're, we've currently entered year four or five. The Coastal Connections focuses on the following priority species. The, Big number one is the Australasian bittern. Um, then the next one is orange bellied parrot. Uh, we support migratory shorebird actions. And during the first year of the program, we also supported hooded plover management actions. Um, the hooded plovers have actually since then gotten their own very large project under NLP funding. Now, I'll only focus on Australasian bittern for my talk because uh, you've just heard from Marta about migratory shorebirds and there will be presentations in the, the near future about orange bellied parrots and hooded plovers by their various experts. So here we go. There's a nice picture of Australasian bittern. Um, we also know, know it as the boomer or the bunyip bird. It's a wetland bird critically endangered um, population. It sits around the 3,500 is the current estimate. Um, it's a very cryptic wetland bird, so it's, it's hard to discover. The threats um, that it suffers from is they're all related to wetlands. So diversion of water away from wetlands, loss through drainage, inappropriate burning of wetlands, grazing of wetlands, of course, climate change and water quality issues. Just a quick throwback to the initial project area in the bottom map there for coastal connections. Um, luckily, as we found more and more bitterns um, in wetlands inland, we were able to extend and we've now got the whole of the CMA covered for our bittern recovery actions. Um, as I mentioned earlier, one of the big threats to um, bitterns is drainage of suitable habitat. Uh, what we do within the project is hydrological restoration to keep water in the area for longer. So in this um, before and after picture, you see how effective that can be after a bit of rain. Um, is a, we've got works in progress on nearly 50 hectares, uh, another 50 to be real in the next 18 months. And that's delivered through Nature Glen Elk Trust. The next um, threat we're addressing is grazing and overall management practices. And as you can see in the picture, stock removal is very, very effective to let wetland vegetation recover. So that is one of the areas that um, Glen Elk Hopkins is, is working on with landholders 
to take stock of suitable habitat for wheat, for beetoons and let the let the vegetation come back. Inappropriate burning was one of the threats. Um, we are working with Gunditj Mearing traditional owners, uh, mainly on the Terendara IPA to learn more about um, the effects of traditional burning practices on that wetland habitat. Um, it is a uh, it's a very interesting space, and there's a lot of um, th there's a lot of bittern experts who are really interested in learning about these outcomes. Um, so a big target there is is burns on 45 hectares of wetlands and and what that does is um we found that it really opens up some some really dense um almost clogged up reedy um, monotone vegetation to to open that up and provide a little bit more space for bitterns to forage in moving on to our next focus area is the the knowledge gap surrounding bitterns they are a very cryptic species um, I like to hide in dense reedy vegetation. What we know about them is um, part of it's derived from European literature on European bitterns, and a lot of it in Australia comes from research that has happened in New South Wales in the um, Riverine in the Bitterns in Rice project. We didn't have uh, an extensive knowledge base about bitterns in our own area. So um, our delivery partners, BirdLife, are trying to address that through various surveys, so in-person listening surveys, um, wetland surveys, citizen science, an attempt at satellite tracking, um, which is again worthy of another presentation in itself, I think. Um, we've had to unfortunately abandon that attempt, but um, because they're so difficult to catch and to track down. But we are um, focusing on on getting some more information in. We've actually, through uh, our intensified efforts, have discovered now two new areas, two new swamps. Um, where we've heard bittern calling this spring, um, and these were previously unknown. So there's no rec records of bitterns at these two swamps. So um, that is pretty exciting news. Coming back to this theme of connections, really, you'd think that uh, for each of the delivery partners, the um, the link to the outcome is pretty straightforward and um, all sort of separated, but I think mainly th during the last 18 months during COVID, we've seen a lot more cross um, networking and connections happening. So there's a bit of uh, uh, exchange here between hydrological restoration and uh, working with land holders to improve management. Um, when there's been a lot of influx through the land care networks. Um, Nature Glen Elk Trust have engaged with Gunij Mearing and are rolling out a bird identification course. Um, bird life are in touch with Gunij Mearing traditional owners and engaging uh, more specific bittern education and, and management practices. Um, both Glen Elk Hopkins and Nature Glen Elk Trust have helped out when bird life officers were stuck in Melbourne with bitten surveys recently. Bird life have also established a citizen science project to find out more about um, calling bitterns. And one of those, uh, or two of those citizen scientists will be featured in our Glen Elk uh, podcast very soon. Um, We've had people from the Citizen Science Project who are now engaged in, within the Glen Elk Hopkins to deliver uh, uh, as a youth employment 
program officer. So there have been heaps of cross connections. Um, and then we've also linked to other bittern practitioners, uh, which continues here. So we've got, uh, we've basically built up a whole network with linkages with other CMAs, CSIRO, other projects, museums, Victoria, um, land care, bird life groups, project managers, consultants, the Australian government, and even researchers in New Zealand and New Caledonia. So they've all um, helped to progress the, the project to where it's sitting at the moment. Um, within this bit and practitioners network, we've had two big online workshops to exchange knowledge. Um, we're looking at revitalizing the newsletter and and basically just connecting people with each other so we've got contact details for most of the people in this group at the moment and hopefully that all leads to um, plenty more of this little baby boomers and they were found um, last spring during during our field work look how cute so if you know of any bittern habitat that needs protecting or um, I've heard calling recently, please get in touch, connect with us, with me or with BirdLife. Um, I'm really very happy to, to hear any thoughts, uh, observations or questions. Thank you, Jacinta. That was very informative and a great, great slide to end on. Um, just quickly, Jacinta, there is one question in there. Uh, we've got time for one. What native flora species can we protect or plant more of to help encourage bitterns to use as habitat? What are the reasons they yeah. prefer rice fields as opposed to native wetlands? Yes, um, it's um, the good news is that uh, the the flora is quite variable. We're looking at wetlands that aren't too deep, around 30 centimetres deep um, that hold water for, for quite a bit of time would be great. Um, and then a variety of, of species really, uh, a lot of that um, denser, uh, reedy, rushy vegetation mass. mass um, um, yeah, so phragmites, bulrush, sedges, those sort of thing, but also some, some areas that are a little bit more open with some triglocan, um, those so floating um, emerging species. Um, yeah, where, where there's a little bit more space to forage around where they've got, because they're herons, they actually use their eyes to catch prey. So they're little frogs and, you know, all those little fish, little reptiles. Um, that's the main focus. Thanks, Jacinta. That's um, great to hear. There's a couple of other follow-ups there. A few people are putting some comments in the chat, just a, a few bits and pieces you might just want to have a look at over the next 15 minutes or so. Um, but thank you again for your time today. Um, very much enjoyed that and we appreciate your time. Uh, our next uh, speaker is, who I welcome, is from Parks Victoria, Michael Sands. Uh, Michael's going to talk to us today around Beyond the Shoreline, Marine Monitoring in Discovery Bay, Marine National Park. Welcome, Michael. Thanks, Peter. Uh, let me know when that's coming through. Yep. Um, yeah, just to begin with, I'd like to um, acknowledge the Rwandri people on whose country I am transmitting to you from today um, and pay my respects to their elders, past and present. Um, yeah, so today I just wanted to share a monitoring program that we're going to begin um, in Discovery Bay Marine National Park. Um, so it's going to commence in summer. So uh, just a lot of the pictures that you're going to see aren't from Discovery Bay, they're from other marine national parks. Um, but this should give you an idea of what we're going to do. Um, so to begin with, just as a bit of background, um, I don't know if you can see my mouse on the screen, but um, Victoria has a system of 13 marine national parks and marine sanctuaries that span the state from the east up here in Cape Howe and Discovery Bay being the westernmost marine national park. So these parks were set up um, to 
protect representative biodiversity and um, ecological processes, um, habitat, flora and fauna uh, for future generations. So they're effectively no take reserves, so no harvesting um, or catch allowed in them. People are obviously allowed to access them for education, um, research uh, and recreational purposes. Um, but really their purpose is primarily about protecting um, biodiversity and important marine habitat. So um, we need to understand that as the managers of, the, of these marine protected areas. So we run a program called the Signs of Healthy Parks Marine Monitoring Program. Um, and uh, we do this in partnership with Deakin University. So they actually get out there and do a lot of the monitoring. But yeah, the purpose of this monitoring program is essentially to understand the condition and trends of natural values um, inside our marine national parks and sanctuaries. And so our program is quite comprehensive and I'll get into the details of it in a sec. Um, and so because of this, we're not really able to do it in every single um, marine national park and sanctuary that we have across the whole state. Um, we, uh, the approach that we take is that we monitor at least one of the major marine protected areas in each of Victoria's marine bioregions. So Victoria has been split up into bioregions based on um, broad differences in you know, I guess oceanographic processes, water temperature, uh, and the flora and fauna that you find there. And so these um, marine national parks that I've shown here that have the yellow squares around them are the ones that we focused on. So Cape Howe in the far east, Wilson's Prom in the Flinders region here, um, Port Phillip Bay in the Port Phillip Bay embayment area, and then uh, Point Addis out here in Bass Strait and then Discovery Bay. Um, and because these programs are quite comprehensive, the approach we take is we don't monitor um, every park every year. We do kind of a rotating campaign around the state uh, and spend each year we kind of focus on one. And so where we're up to at the moment is we've completed monitoring for these major marine parks in the central and eastern parts of the state with the green tick. And now it's Discovery Bay's turn. And we actually haven't done this monitoring program in Discovery Bay yet. So it's quite exciting to be able to get in there and have a look and see what's under the water. Um, so just as a bit of context for those who aren't familiar with Discovery Bay Marine Park, this is it here just off the um, coast of Cape Bridgewater there on the other side of Bridgewater Bay. Um, the red area here is the boundary of, to the Marine National Park. Uh, what this map is showing you, are these are depth contours. So with the darker color corresponding to the different depths, um, of the Marine National Park. And I guess essentially uh, one of the key features of, of Discovery Bay is it's really quite a deep national park. So there's shallow reef down in the southeast here, but it drops down to be quite deep very quickly. There's sort of a shelf here. Um, and and that poses a bit of a challenge for monitoring. Um, but, uh, and, and just to clarify, our monitoring will, will take place under the sea. So there won't be any intertidal or terrestrial monitoring. It's all about what's going on underneath the water. Um, it's a pretty uh, rugged coast along here, not super easy to get into. Uh, and I guess one of the cool features about it that we're interested in is it's uh, potentially a climate refuge in future. So it gets these cool upwellings all through summer from the Bonnie upwelling. Um, and uh, we expect that that'll help maintain cool temperatures there. So it could become an important refuge as sea temperatures climb under, as expected under climate change. So we do know a little bit about what's in Discovery Bay Marine National Park. So we've had some broad habitat mapping done in the past. Um, this map here is just to give you an idea of the types of habitat we find in Discovery Bay. Uh, so the colors in this map correspond to different habitat types. So these yellow areas are basically sandy plains. So unvegetated, they don't have reef on them. Um, and so a substantial part of the park is are these large sandy plains. But down here in the southeast, there's some really complicated shallow reef, and that's really important habitat for these kelp forests and kelp habitat there. And, and the, the kelp forest is really important habitat again for loads of fish, marine invertebrates that use that complex habitat they create, uh, herbivores that graze on it. Um, but then as you get deeper, uh, we start to get these quite interesting invertebrate reef um, habitats that are mixed in with sandy areas where we get these big, really colorful sponge gardens um, that, that are really quite unique to Victoria and and um, I guess poorly understood, but really cool um, features and habitats. So in terms of what we're monitoring, we can't monitor everything um, everywhere, which I'm sure everyone's 
a problem that everyone knows about. So our, our um, approach is to focus on the key habitat in the Marine National Park. And so behind that approach is the assumption that if habitat's in good and healthy condition, um, then that's likely to mean that most of the other species that are supported by that habitat are also in good, healthy condition and that we're protecting biodiversity and ecological processes. So with that in mind, the key things that we focus on are the subtitle reef communities. Um, so like down in that southeastern part of the Marine National Park. So these are dominated by these seaweeds. So brown macroalgae, brown seaweed, and then you get the red algae in deeper waters. Tons of fish and invertebrates living in here. We're also interested in the subtitle reef. So once you get deeper and there's not enough sunlight, um, the kelp drops away and the reefs become dominated by I guess a simple way to describe these is the sponge gardens and they're made up of these large sponges but they also have things like soft corals um, which is shown here I don't know if you can see my mouse but this kind of fluorescent looking thing is a soft coral these feathery things are hydroids related to soft corals and then other creatures like bryozoans um, and this is really critical habitat for a lot of the deeper invertebrates and fish it provides that complex structure for them to live in um, we're also interested in monitoring um, the larger mobile invertebrates. So in particular, what we monitor are things like abalone and rock lobster. So we're interested in these species because uh, they're, they're not necessarily protected just by protecting habitat alone. They are um, subject to fishing pressure outside the Marine National Park. And we do get illegal poaching and harvesting of these species. So by looking at them, we can get a sense of whether the park's doing its job um, in protecting those species um, and whether compliance work is needed to do further protection or anything like that. Uh, we also look at um, other larger mobile invertebrates that we know are kind of good indicators of, of a healthy reef. So things like some of these larger sea stars and large sea slugs that you can see in the bottom left here. We will look at the subtitle soft sediment habitat. So basically the sandy habitat. So even though these are kind of featureless habitats um, in some ways, there's not many obvious life above ground. They are really important habitat for lots of fish. So we do get quite a lot of um, significant fish populations moving through these areas. And they also in some areas support these kind of um, quite weird and unique looking reef communities that you can see in the bottom right here. So these upright kind of sponge gardens that exist where you have sand and rock meeting. And again, they, they are really important habitat for lots of fish, um, important nursery grounds and um, feeding grounds for them. And then lastly, the other thing we monitor are the large mobile fish. So what we tend to focus on are the fish that uh, we call site attached, so that they like living on reefs and they don't move around too much. Marine protected areas are a place-based um, means of protecting biodiversity. So they don't work for things like you know whales and really large migratory species that travel huge difference, distances um, because they're simply yeah, they're, they're, they're too fixed in space to do that. So we're interested in the reef and, and site attached fish and then some of the larger fish that are, are good indicators of healthy reef and sandy ecosystems. So things like, for example, the blue groper, uh, which we know is, is subject to fishing pressure. It can experience illegal poaching, um, but the, having large fish like that is a good sign that, that um, the reef's healthy and it's, it's protecting biodiversity. And similar with things like this Port Jackson shark you know, the more larger predators there are in the park is generally a sign of a healthy ecosystem with lots of available food and not too much fishing pressure. And so how we do this, so one of the ways that we'll do this is, is simply by taking underwater footage. Or I say simply, it uh, can be quite complicated, but what we do, I'll, I'll start this video and hopefully it'll work and you'll be able to see it, but we send either um, towed video cameras down or uh, we're partnering, hoping to partner this year with the Commonwealth Government using uh, a kind of robot called an autonomous underwater vehicle and these swim under the sea um, and as they're going along we capture images of that and those images go back and they get analysed and we're able to identify what types of um, biological communities are, are there um, and also look for indicators of healthy communities so things like good algal coverage, good coverage of sessile invertebrates and that those keystone species are there. Um, the second thing that we're undertaking is baited remote underwater video or bruvs. So these are basically cameras that we drop on the seafloor. Um, then they have a bait at the end of the stick and fish come along to investigate or nibble on the bait. Uh, and we capture images of that. Um, we have two cameras, so we're actually able to measure the size of fishes using those two cameras. And um, 
from that, we get a good idea of the type, the number, um, and the size of fish species. Uh, and we're able to compare the types of fish that we find across different habitat types. So that gives us a good understanding of what and how it's using the, how, how fish are using different habitats to inform management. Um, and also what we're doing is deploying these bruvs inside and outside of the park. So this isn't Discovery Bay here, this is Point Addis Marine National Park, but just to give you an idea of what I mean. So the, the, the um, dotted boundaries here is the national park outside is outside the national park and these circles are where we've deployed bruvs and the idea is that we can compare fish populations inside and outside marine national park um, and we do expect differences so you're allowed to fish outside national parks and not allowed to fish inside so we expect to see some differences um, that that would tell us that the national park is protecting fish diversity there um, yeah and it gives us a good sense of whether the park's doing its job. And we're also going to do similar things with the Southern Rock Lobster. Um, so I'll, I'll skip through this slide because I'm uh, running out of time a bit. But so the idea is we drop lobster, uh, rock lobster pots inside and outside of the Marine National Park. Um, we count the number of lobsters we catch, measure their size and, and their gender, and then um, put them, or their sex, sorry, and then put them back into the water unharmed. So they go back in. And this is, and we do it inside and outside of the park, just as we do with fish to get an idea of what populations inside the park look like um, compared to those outside. And again, with a similar idea to under, understand if the park is protecting those rock lobster populations. And I, will, I won't talk to this figure in, in heaps of detail, but this is a result that came back from Point Addis Marine National Park and that we're finding in other marine national parks, which is quite cool where we're finding that inside the marine national park, we have a lot more larger rock lobsters um, and in particular larger, a lot more males, um, but both males and females are larger. And it was a really good example of how marine protected areas um, provide broader ecosystem benefits. So what will happen with with these rock lobsters is when they reproduce, their offspring will swim off into the sea. They spend up to two years out at sea before they come back to a reef to settle. Um, and so they can disperse a long distance from the park. And so by having a really healthy intact population in Point Addis, we're ensuring that there's a good population of, um, of species, uh, a good population protected that will replenish uh, populations outside that marine national park. Um, and so just quickly, I've probably touched on all of these, but what we're aiming to learn is what the condition of key habitats and species is within Discovery Bay Marine National Park uh, to get an increased understanding of the distribution of key habitat types. So to try and improve on those earlier maps that I showed, um, understand relationships between fish abundances and distribution of key habitat types, and really get a sense of where the benefits of protection are being realised. Are there signs of a legal take of harvest in the MPA and, and anything else that tells us there might be a problem that requires um, active management. And if you want to find out more just quickly, the results of this, it'll probably take us a couple of years, I think, to wrap up this monitoring. Maybe by the end of, of next calendar year, we might be done, but it, it's quite a substantial bit of work once you take into account the monitoring data analysis and then putting the report together. Um, and that'll come out as a Parks Victoria technical series publication. Um, we'll also put out some media and comms, plain English summaries as we go. The, the tech series publication is really written for a more scientifically trained audience. So we're keen to put out um, stuff that's simpler to access to, to, to describe what we're finding in Discovery Bay. And also I'm really happy for people to contact me. Um, so I'm happy to discuss this project more with anyone who's interested, share our results as we get them. Um, and I'm also keen to hear any insights or knowledge that, that anyone might have about Discovery Bay, because like I said, we can't monitor everything. Um, and so building in some of that other knowledge is, is really um, a great thing. So that's me, thanks very much. Thanks, Michael. Um, that was very interesting. Great seeing some underwater uh, activity and also some of your uh, monitoring and uh, good to see a healthy population of gummy sharks in there as well on your on your bruvs. So yeah. um, look, we aren't gonna have time for any questions for Michael just at the moment because we have sort of hit time for um, morning tea uh, or a, a quick break. Uh, if there is anything in the chat, Michael's probably all right to answer it. Um, we will take a break now. Um, it was going to be a 10 minute break. What are we, 11, 16? Um, if you could have you back in here, uh, we've got 11, 20, we'll say uh, 11, 25. I'll give you um, eight minutes. Sorry, I'm taking two minutes from you. Um, now, I just want to thank all our presenters uh, this morning for that first session. That's been really um, interesting and a, and a range of subjects covered. 
Uh, I'm going to be handing the baton over to Saul Vermeer, and, uh, who's um, part of the um, NEP team in the Bar and South West, and he'll be taking you for uh, the second half of the forum. So, um, yeah, we will leave this running just so that the chat can continue from any of the presenters. Um, but if you could be back here, as I say, by 11.25 sharp, that was when the next presentations will start. And just a reminder to the next presenters that um, um, there'll be 10 minutes um, presenting and, and five minutes for questions. So um, thank you all and thanks for your participation. Perfect timing, Saul. Sounds good. Thanks, Lou. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Saul Vermeeren. Um, I'm part of the Natural Environment Programs team at DELP. I'll be running you through the second part of today. Uh, again, we've got an action-packed agenda. We will be finishing up at about 12.45, I'd say. Um, uh, I'm sitting on Wadarong country at the moment in Anglesey, so I'd like to pay my respects to elders past and present. Uh, we'll probably uh, jump into the first presenter, which is Elia Pertle from uh, Victoria Volcanic Plains Biosphere. Um, Elia, how are you going with uh, access and sharing screens? Are you, you, are you all set up? Yeah, all good now. <laughs> Fantastic. I'll pass over to you. All right. Pop into slide two. And all good? Yeah, we can see that. Great. All right, um, thanks very much for having me. My name's Aliyah Pertle. Um, I'm working with the Victorian Volcanic Plain Biosphere Incorporated Group as a project coordinator. Um, I am calling in today from Jabwarung um, country, just over here in this in this picture near, um, near Ararat, um, and acknowledge um, elders past, present, and emerging. And today I would like to talk to you about the Victorian Volcanic Plains region, which does extend into um, Gudinjamirin country as well. And, and we'll start with this picture, which is um, unfortunately not really the image of the uh, most Victoria that um, comes to mind when most people think about what Victoria looks like, but indeed is what Victoria looked like for tens of thousands of years with um, expansive um, grasslands and grassy woodlands and um, seasonal wetlands and lakes going all the way from Melbourne to the South Australian border. And to make a very long story short, today, this is the image that's much uh, more familiar. And what's happened is um, what was once 2.3 million hectares of, of these natural habitats have been reduced to just about 1%, and the grassy woodlands and, and um, grassland habitats are now critically endangered. And today at a um, biodiversity forum, I don't think I have to spend too much time, I guess, explaining why, why that's quite, a, um, quite a, a sad thing to know. Um, and I think we all would have our own personal reasons for, for why we are interested in biodiversity and conservation and restoring these um, lost habitats whether it's an appreciation of an inherent right for um, biodiversity to exist or a love of, um, a love of birds or of, of wildflowers, um, an acknowledgement that this loss of habitat is, is more than just environmental, it's a huge cultural loss as well, um, but also an acknowledgement that these habitats are a really integral um, part of a lot of livelihoods on the Victorian Plains region, um, fertile soil supporting farms and um, beautiful beaches um, and volcanic areas um, drawing tourists to small towns. And so this idea that, you know, there's really quite a lot of diverse reasons why we care about biodiversity and natural habitats is the idea behind the project that I want to talk to you about today, which is um, focusing on trying to build um, a sort of unified um, sense of community on the Victorian Volcanic Plains region um, built around pride for native, native habitats culture and history, and acknowledging the, the importance of those habitats to a lot of livelihoods and, and creating a desire to preserve those into the future. And the program um, that we're investigating, which might be a way to build sort of this, this unity of, of values, um, is called the Biosphere Program. And the group that I'm working with is, is working on um, establishing a Victorian Volcanic Plains Biosphere 
which in, you know, our, our really big goal is perhaps this could even extend all the way from Melbourne suburbs to, um, to the South Australian border. Now, if you haven't heard of what a biosphere program is, um, we actually heard a little bit about the sister program this morning, the World Heritage Program, which is also run through the United Nations via UNESCO. The Biosphere Program is um, one of the UNESCO projects, and this one in particular focuses on the relationship between humans and the environment. And as a real quick um, picture of where it sits in the international um, world of, of organizations, um, it's created. it was created in the 60s through collaborations with the United Nations and quite a few NGOs. Um, and you can see it was created just a few years earlier than the World Heritage Convention. But what makes this program quite unique is that its hallmark is that the Biosphere program has created a, a, a global community of sites that they call Biosphere Reserves. And these sites are test places where there's research to create local solutions to um, global problems of balancing humans and the environment. And these are really very different from a national park or a conservation reserve because these sites um, have a lot of communities of humans living in them. And in fact, in these 714 reserves across the globe, there's 250 million people living inside of them. And that's why the goal of these biospheres can't stop at just conservation, um, just habitat. Um, and in fact, according to, um, to the strategy that sets the goals, there's three focuses. These biospheres have to support conservation, they have to support sustainable development, and they have to provide scientific and technical support within their boundaries. And so that's what makes these biosphere programs very unique, um, is that they're recognizing that in a landscape, particularly one fragmented with a lot of human activity, there's gonna be a patchwork of priorities that you'll need to um, balance and navigate. And again, without going into too much detail, because I really just wanna give the big picture today, they navigate that patchwork by actually creating a patchwork within their, um, their own program by delineating some parts of the biosphere that are really high conservation value cores, delimiting, delimit, delimiting some parts that, um, that have a lot of blended use and some parts that have a focus on communities. And there are actually four other biospheres in Australia. Um, our closest neighbor is just down here um, near the Mornington Peninsula, Western Port Biosphere. And we have quite a lot to learn from the program they've built. Um, and this one here, Noosa, which is just up here in Queensland, we also have a lot to learn from them because they are our youngest biosphere and just won one of UNESCO's highest awards. Now, the idea behind these biosphere programs, the three things that they, um, that they contribute is they create more coordination and collaboration, um, they bring recognition to their to their um, to their site and their habitats um, and their cultures, and they coordinate and attract research. Um, but the idea being that we want to build we want to build feedback loops between this. So we want more coordination in order to raise our recognition, in order to access more funding, in order to bring higher quality research, and those research outcomes attract new research partners and the improved outcomes bring even more recognition. So you're trying to build this, this loop. And to try and explain a bit better the way that's done, because this can sound like a pretty high level um, you know, program and it really helps to see how it's been enacted by others. Um, this, I'll give you just an example of how the Western Port Biosphere runs. And so there is this Biosphere organization. For Western Port, it's a, um, it's a the Biosphere Foundation is the formal body. They have a board of directors. Um, they secure a seat for their local traditional owner representatives, which is the Bunurong Land Council. They also have representatives on the board from each um, council. And because this is a, um, a foundation that, that meets regularly, it does have some operational costs. And so that needs to be provided. And that's by the group we kind of call the champions of the biosphere. And in the case of Western Port Biosphere, they get regular funding from their five councils, as well as some funding from state and federal government. And because the goal of this program is, um, well, to maintain its credential, the, the Biosphere also has to continue reporting to the United Nations UNESCO program. Um, but the goal of this Biosphere ultimately is, we're trying to build win-wins between environment, society, and economy, looking for places of overlap where, um, where you, can, you can bring a lot of people together for the same goal of protecting habitat. 
And the way it does that is by pursuing projects that um, build these win-wins. And this is, I think, where the biosphere really shines is that they, they assemble really diverse partnerships to work on these projects. Um, Noosa and Western Port both have, have pretty um, diverse teams, including um, representatives in you know, universities, philanthropic organizations, land cares, community groups, conservation groups, traditional owner groups, local schools, industry groups, um, tourism industry has a big a partner, is a big partner at the Noosa Biosphere, for instance. Um, Western Port has done a lot of partnering with um, agricultural and, um, and, and um, industries like um, chicken farms, for instance. And they bring knowledge and manpower. Um, and of course, funding is a huge, is, um, is a huge, of a huge importance too. And the Biosphere team can get together and, and gain more power um, in numbers to apply for um, grants from state and federal government, from CMAs, um, obtaining funds from their local councils, and also gaining the attention of philanthropic groups. So I hope that gives um, a bit of a sense of exactly what these look like. Um, what they want to achieve is projects that focus on this overlap between um, goals that support humans, but also support the environment that we can all kind of agree on. And as just some inspiration, I wanted to give some quick examples of the type of programs that Noosa Biosphere um, um, have been pursuing and actually won a, the highest award from UNESCO earlier this year. And a really nice example is this Bring Back the Fish project, um, where, where at the realization that um, the oysters in the Noosa River had gone functionally extinct, and that's a huge environmental loss, but also a cultural one because they were a staple food um, source for their cabby cabby peoples. Um, there was a, a really collaborative project that involved um, LIDAR mapping, like you heard about before, um, to target erosion damage, but also the creation of artificial oyster reefs. It brought together researchers from the university. It brought together fisheries who donated supplies. It brought together um, tourism groups because um, these oysters were the basis of a very important recreational fishing and tourism industry. Um, it brought together all these groups for a pilot that established these new oyster beds, had pretty exciting results, and attracted in the Nature Conservancy to um, come in and take over the project with a pretty big um, investment. Now, um, since I think I'm just about out of time, I don't think we have to um, try that hard to imagine how um, a, really a really coordinated effort across this whole region of the volcanic plains, which is so fragmented, um, could bring a lot of benefits. And to very briefly tell you what we need to do to achieve this, um, well, we'd need to figure out who could champion a biosphere program. We need to figure out who wants to be involved in a biosphere program and what they would want out of it. And then we can try to build it. And so today, I guess the questions I want to leave with you um, is a big priority will be how do we structure this biosphere program to ensure um, involvement of everyone who wants to be involved, particular traditional owner groups, um, and what you would actually want out of a biosphere. What are the sort of really big picture research goals that are hard to access right now? What sort of recognition goals, community goals? What knowledge do you want to share and what knowledge do you want to gain? Um, so I'll leave it at that. Um, and thank you very much for having me. It's just... Thanks, Leah. That was, uh, that was fantastic. Um, I haven't got any questions in the uh, conversation box at the moment, but um, I know you've got a couple of questions for us. So if anyone's uh, got any questions for Aaliyah, chuck them in the box um, and uh, I'm sure she can get back to you uh, next uh, 10 minutes or so. So thanks very much for that one. Thank you. And, uh, and I guess right. what, I'll, what I'll just say is I'll pop my email in the chat as well, because if anybody would like to have a bit more of a conversation about, you know, I guess what your really big picture goals could be that are hard to achieve under the sort of current um, current programs. I'd really love to to get your ideas and I'll just type my email in the chat. Great, sounds good. Thank you for that. Alrighty, so uh, we're going to move on to um, Dr. Mark Gregakoulos, uh, who's um, going to be chatting to us about satellite data to develop useful tools for surveillance monitoring. Um, so I'll uh, pass over to you, Mark, and um, yeah, welcome. Okay, thank you very much. And while I'm sitting here navigating to my to my presentation, I can ask the, the question of, I guess, uh, my, um, uh, make a comment in relation to a biosphere. I'm very keen that a biosphere 
takes into account a document like Biodiversity 2037. So whatever outcomes you're looking at for biodiversity, as long as they deliver what our targets and outcomes are defined by Biodiversity 2037, that's my first, uh, that's my first caveat. Thanks, Saul. Um, I guess I'll start this presentation now, somewhere down here, and actually that's hidden, so I can't see it. Okay. My name's Mark Garkarkos. I've been working uh, with Barb Wilson, my partner, for, for a long time now, and, uh, and we've been working with a, a, a fabulous group of, of colleagues in, uh, in Gundij, uh, Mirin country in far western Victoria. I'm speaking to you from Wadarung country, and I'd just like to acknowledge uh, traditional owners of Wadarung country, where we also work, and also our colleagues and, and peoples of the East of Ma, uh, who will uh, be hosting the next uh, seminar series on Thursday. We've been involved in some pro projects that work at many levels. They work from the landscape down to the site. And in fact, I guess historically, we've gone from the site and slowly but surely we've worked our, our way up to the landscape. And once we get up to the landscape, we're into space. Space gives us that opportunity to look at big areas of the landscape through our uh, treaties, through our international relations with the United States and the European Union, we have access to remarkable data sets. Um, and I'm just gonna give you some examples of how we're taking those data sets, but not really asking so we are asking scientific questions, but we've learned by working with our colleagues to think about what sort of tools we can get out of this that people can use when they're on the ground. And it's been a fabulous process for Barbara and myself and, and our colleagues. It's been, it covers several projects that we've been working over for the last few years. Uh, they include the Reducing Bushfire Risk Program, uh, but importantly, um, I don't know if it's still a working program with regard to Victorian government, but the Safer Together program was one that was really instrumental in getting a lot of this work together because our colleague uh, Dustin Bridges was working at Parks Victoria and he was, he was able to work with forest fire management as part of what we were doing. And it was his remote sensing data engineering skills that were really kicking us off in the right sort of direction. I'm going to give a brief interview, uh, introduction to the Forest Fire Management Victoria Landscape Assessment Projects, and they're in Gunditch Mirren country. Uh, really just an over, overview of really just talking about what they are rather than what the outcomes were. And there's three main projects, or probably four, that are encaptured, uh, encapsulated in the Far Southwest Invasive Coast Waddle Mapping Project, which we commenced in 2019. Then uh, we undertook a pine wildling uh, modelling project. Uh, in 2020. Uh, in 2020, we also started looking at forest health and we were quite curious about the condition of, of uh, brown stringy bark and desert stringy bark in particular. And then we were starting to ask questions about, oh, are we seeing any refuges within in the, in, in the landscape? Now, out of this, we were asking lots of questions, doing lots of data survey, harvesting data sets, uh, doing statistical analyses, starting to consider trends uh, from a scientific uh, perspective. But at the same time, it was becoming really clear to me and Barbara as we listened, was that we needed to also consider a dis different approach. For us working down in the far southwest, we were working with a group of land managers who get out and get in their vehicles very every day. And as a team, they're actually working a lot of the time really as a group on their own. And it was clear to us from the messages we were getting and the advice we were asked for, that what they would really like out of our project are more tools to help them do their job on the ground every time they get into the car. It's things that help them better understand the, their immediate um, decision making. And that's all about situational awareness. So what this, these, all these projects, uh, I guess, culminated in wasn't just reports, but there are these little outputs. And those little outputs were maps, essentially. And they, they can become really useful for navigating. And perhaps it's the most underrated but, but most important aspect of conservation management, which is that ability to be able to undertake surveillance immediately and to react really nimbly. We can't wait for a two-year project to make decisions that we need to make 
immediately in many instances. We can get a lot of help by using available satellite data. The top image on, on the right hand side there is the uh, test images from Landsat 9 that was launched this year. Landsat series gives us data that actually goes back to the mid 1970s. We have access to really well processed data to 1995 through to current through uh, available through Geosciences Australia. The satellite underneath the image, uh, so that image is actually showing dark green areas of mangroves in the northwest of Australia that were used as some of the training for, for Landsat 9 imagery that's currently underway as they commissioned that satellite. Uh, Sentinel-2, uh, the European Space um, Union uh, uh, Space Agency satellite is one that's used routinely in, in uh, fire management and biodiversity management, and it's a fabulous data set for us to be able to use. Landsat has a long time series, best long time series of any monitoring program in the world. It's outstanding. Sentinel-2, a really much more sophisticated instrument than this, the Landsat and a finer resolution. So the two together allow us to do lots of things scientifically. The area for, we're interested in is really um, almost all of Gundich Mirren country. For instance, so that blue outline we have on this map here is part of the Wattle project that we first looked at. Uh, but we're also uh, uh, been looking at work in Kabobini. Uh, we've extended what we're doing in terms of refugees work out to, to Budjabim and Mount Napier, getting in a feel for, for what uh, our satellite time series is showing us out there and understanding perhaps any changes that we're seeing in that environment in these environments over time. There's lots of lots of I must admit there's a lot of outcomes from these three projects um, and some of those uh, uh, are really intriguing and they could ask lots more questions about management. Uh, with the invasive coast wattle project, one of the things they really wanted to understand, and that was dealt, was how far has it spread? And we now know, working on that, that it's moved 50 kilometres uh, in 20 years inland. Where is, uh, where is coast wattle bad? Uh, we certainly know, of course, and many people see this in Lower Glenelg, to jerk those sorts of other areas. Where is their low density? We actually know there's some areas where uh, it has been well controlled and we think we can see a biodiversity benefit for that. And um, But given that you've got this spatial data, as you start to look at this model and those red areas in the right right hand picture on the right hand side show very dense coast wattle infestations, you can actually start to pick up these at a much finer scale and you can actually see these in the field as you drive around. The Pine Wildling project uh, was uh, over this same area of interest and the little red dots in the picture indicate a likelihood of pine. It's a pine detection model. Um, this uh, one here shows areas that are associated close to pine forests and, and sure enough, you're getting a lot of wildling infestation there. In the bottom, just above north, uh, that's, uh, that's Wilkin. And there's a fair bit of work underway there at the moment uh, in collaboration with the uh, Nature Glenelg Trust, the CMAs and, and forest fire management in terms of control of that. Now that we have these models, we've got the ability to actually look at uh, uh, success in terms of uh, a monitoring and evaluation program. But more importantly, these maps here can be used immediately. Our forest health and refuges project is starting to delve into forest condition and the index that we've used as being uh, easy to repeat and shows us good signals is, is one called NDVI. Uh, it's a good surrogate for, for, surrogate for how green relatively uh, a patch of, of vegetation is. Um, and in this particular uh, in this particular image here, the blue sites are, are areas that we see as being higher NDVI. The yellow sites are lower NDVI. And so once we see these, we start to ask questions about why is that site the way that it is? Why is its productivity appeared to be the way that it is? And these are surveillance questions. They're not really scientific questions, but they're very important management questions. Let's take just one example. And I'll use the, the, the mapping app Avenza. I'm not an advocate for Avenza. I just had no idea what mapping apps were before uh, I started any of these projects. And, that, and this, was, this was the app that they said, oh, we all use Avenza. Can you stick something onto Avenza so that we can actually use it on our phones? Uh, and uh, this is an example of where we have the Pine model on the left-hand side and the NDVI model on the right-hand side. 
Uh, you can see where the red arrow is uh, on my pine model. It's telling me there's a lot of pine there. Uh, on my NDVI model, it's telling me, ah, you've got very, very high productivity there. What is at this spot? When I actually go to that spot, there's a lot of pine. There's a hell of a lot of pine. The understory is degraded. Uh, and in actual fact, we stuck some remote cameras here and we got no native fauna whatsoever in any of those red dotted areas. We did get deer, uh, which was interesting. So this is just an example of just a little bit of surveillance. If we move our arrow just a couple of hundred metres to the left outside of those little red dots, we go to this spot. And on my pine wildling model, it's telling me I've got no pine. Uh, on my uh, NDVI model on the right there, it's telling me I've got a green area. And when I look at time series for Landsat, it's been a very stable site, although it has kicked up a bit with the good rains most recently. When I trap that particular site, which is walking distance from my original site, only take me three minutes to walk, I get lots of native fauna. I get a high species richness. These sites are statistically significantly different. Now, I've got the ability to start to navigate to lots of these sorts of spots and interplay between those data sets, those spatial data sets, by just sticking these maps on my phone. And I took this photo yesterday, I was bombing together this presentation, and I thought, oh, how do I show them the phone? I'll take a photo of the phone. So here's my phone with the Venza maps loaded onto it. And uh, there you can see that I'm in the same area. I've got that and you can navigate to these particular sites as you move around. This is great stuff for our young firefighting managers, our young biodiversity conservation managers, all of them to stick onto their devices. And when they get in the vehicle, they can start to look at this and it, and it empowers you. I found that it empowers me when I start to go, oh, okay, I can see some patterns that are happening here. This is not scientific, but I'm, I'm starting to build up a sense of risk. I'm starting to build up some knowledge about what I think is important based on really guesswork about several different data sets that I've got here. This is the Pine Wildling model on the same uh, Avenza system. So that's what we've just been looking at. And you can see that you can start to geo-reference what it is that you want to do uh, or, or geo-reference anything that you're witnessing. You can start to record events of interest that are really important that reflect these sort of threatening processes that we are trying to manage. This has been a really interesting process for me and Barbara. Barbara's there on the right. And I think that that posture that Barbara has now is something that both of us, after having many, many decades working in conservation sciences in universities and management right around the world, that posture is now really important to us because where we're learning is actually from those other three um, shady characters who are really highly trained. They're in the age group, say, 24 to 40. They appreciate working in a team, but they have a good sense of what it is they need to do their job. And as scientists, um, I think this is the thing that has really uh, led us to go, what tools can we give these guys so that when they get in those vehicles, they're able to start to do their job a little bit more precisely with a little bit more confidence. And I think I'm gonna end the slideshow there. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Mark. Um, uh, have you finished up on that one? Or are you looking for another slide? Yeah. No, I'm not. I'm all done. I'm just trying to navigate back to Teams. Where am I? Hang on. Uh, here we are. I'm back. Saul, how are you going? <laughs> Good. Thank you. Thanks for that. It was uh, great. And um, it's uh, you've always been uh, a big uh, supporter and advocate for empowering um, uh, staff across local and state government. So it's uh, it's really encouraging and Thanks so much for uh, those kind words. Um, has anyone got any uh, questions for Mark? Oh, yep, there's one here from Yvonne. Um, uh, Mark, Yvonne's asked, does the NDVI pick up native grassy woodland diversity as well? Uh, I wouldn't say diversity, but what you could do if you defined your native area of interest, uh, NDVI using Landsat, we can say how has NDVI changed in that patch over the last 25 years? That's pretty straightforward to do. And I will expand on this as an example. So as we start to inter interrogate 
one year of NDVI, and I did. I should have said that 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 mapping image we used was from 2019 at the height of the Indian Ocean dipole when the east coast of Australia was on fire. So that sort of image, we knew that that system was under stress, and we we could go. Oh, I wonder how that place was doing given that that was the climatic condition at the time. But as we see sites, the, the, the reactions we see in terms of threatening processes are as long as my arm. We can see koala browse, we see phytophthora dieback impacts, we see a good response in desert stringy bark if it's had a good year, we see uh, changes in, um, in peppermint uh, leaf canopy as a result of cup leaf moth infestations. We can see all of those things occurring in sites that we begin to understand and know. So with respect to the grassy woodlands, I would suspect not to be able to answer the question about diversity, but I could answer the question about how has productivity changed? Thanks, Mark. Yeah, the power of satellites, um, it's, it's pretty impressive, something I'd like to learn more about. And um, thanks for the presentation today. Um, all right, we'll, uh, we'll keep moving. Uh, so next up is Mark Rees from University of Melbourne. Uh, he's going to be presenting on the interactions between foxes and feral cats in Southwest Victoria. Um, welcome, uh, Matt, and uh, I'll hand over to you. Thanks. Um, just gonna, sorry. If I share my slides. Here we go. It's all working. Yep, looks great. Thanks. And can you can you see my mouse or is that pushing it? Yep. Brilliant. Well, yeah, I'm Matt. I'm just finishing up my PhD at the University of Melbourne, um, where I looked at how foxes and cats were interacting across Southwest Victoria, uh, and I'm currently today on Yugamba Country in Queensland, and I did. Uh, this research across both um, Guntichmara and Eastern Mar country as well. So, um, yeah, and I, it was I was supervised by Brendan Wintle, um, Ron Hartkradsky, Alan Robley, and had a lot of help from the um, folks at the Conservation Ecology Centre. And so, hopefully, I can just give you a bit of an overview about what I've done to what I've done so far. And if you have any more questions, absolutely get in contact. Alrighty, let's hit it. Okay, so foxes are a massive problem for our native biodiversity. And in Southwest Victoria, where we don't have any dingoes anymore, they might be filling the role of an apex predator. And so what apex predators tend to do is suppress smaller predators, such as the feral cat. And so there's been really big concern across Australia where we've done lots of fox control that this might actually be making things worse in terms of feral cat impacts. Um, and so there's been a bit of research, but it's been quite uncertain whether fox control, uh, you know, increases the numbers or changes the behaviour of feral cats. So my re my PhD was really focused on answering this question. Um, and so this is what we call a mesopredator release. Once you take out the apex predator and the smaller predator uh, increases, and so often, and so this might happen in cats might occur in more sites following fox control. They might, there might be more cats in general, uh, higher population density, or they might have a different behaviour. They might be a lot more relaxed when there's less foxes around. They might go to different places and at different times of the day. And so my PhD was really trying to disentangle these different responses, because often if you just look at detection rates, it's all of these effects merged into one. So I really tried hard to separate these effects in my PhD. And also I wanted to just look at why, what, what drives the occurrence of these invasive predators. And I focused on two threatened prey species, Southern Brown Bandicoot and long nosed Potteroo. And so I've built on a lot of work, which has shown really big effects of fire and vegetation type uh, on these species, uh, less so for, so for predators over the long term. And of course, I wanted to look at fox control in terms of the bait density, so how much effort you go to. And I looked at that uh, differently across the Otway Ranges and the Glenelg region, uh, and fragmentation and also rainfall, whether that's affecting it. And so just, so these are the sites that I worked across, um, so the Glenelg region and the Otway Ranges, and the white dots are all the camera traps that I either deployed and collated. 
uh, thanks to data from the Glenelg Arc Fox Control um, and the Altway Arc Fox Control as well. And so you can see in the red, these are all the poison bait stations that get um, baited for foxes uh, in the Glenelg region. This has been happening over, over, since 2005. Um, so you can just see here, like there's quite a, quite a big variation across uh, space in terms of the density of baits. And we've been monitoring in these baited sites, so like Mount Clay, Kabobany, uh, Logo National Park South, uh, which is separated to the North by a river. And we've also been monitoring uh, these three uh, sites that don't have fox control as a comparison. Uh, and in the Otway Ranges, fox control has occurred a lot more recently, mostly in late November. And we've got, so right across most of the Otways, and we're using this site as an unbaited reference. And because this was a lot more recent, we could actually get in with camera traps beforehand to understand how it directly changed. Um, so yeah, a massive thanks to Parks Victoria and Delp for helping, um, for giving me lots of data and helping with my surveys as well. And nearly, I had nearly 50 field of volunteers, so um, it was a lot of fun. Alrighty, so what drives, uh, what drives the occurrence of these different species? So this is, each different species, each different row is a different species. So we've got foxes, cats, southern brown bandicoots, and potteroos, and it's all on the same scale, just to give you an idea of what's like the strongest driver. Um, and so this first, this first column is uh, the average response of the species to fire. And so you can see that southern brown bandicoots have this really big uh, nonlinear response where they're peaking 20 years and seven years post fire. And there's a lot of deviation in uh, both the occupancy and the response to uh, this fire in the different vegetation types for a lot of the species. Um, and then we have, uh, I'll go into this in a bit more detail, but uh, fox control was a big driver of foxes in the Glenelg region where foxes have been baited for a lot longer. And in the green, you see the old way ranges. Um, not so much of an effect on cats or bandicoots, but really strongly benefiting potteroos in the Glenelg region. Um, and yeah, I, I can touch on this a bit later if anyone wants more information. But this is just how this response looks across the different, the, the time since fire response looks across the different vegetation types. So foxes on average decline in most of them, but in the lowland forests, they do this weird little hump shaped thing. Cats don't really worry too much about time since fire, except for Herdbridge woodlands. And southern brown bandicoots again, um, quite a big response. Um, and potteroos had a bit of variation. So they, they liked long and burnt site in heathlands and heathy woodlands, but they tended to like the recently burnt sites in Herbridge woodlands. So it kind of shows that there is a lot of variation in, well, there is some variation in fire responses across vegetation types. And this is just the, the, fox, dense, the fox bait density um, result just shown again, just showing how strong of a suppressive effect um, particularly the Glenelg region fox baiting has on foxes. Um, so 80% chance of detecting a fox where there's no baiting and that gets pushed down to less than a 20% chance. And the Otway ranges is a bit less, um, a bit less dramatic because it's mostly because it's a bit less intensive and it's just recently started. And yeah, and it's really benefiting potteroos. So the big question I had was whether fox control was increasing cat density. And so to answer this, I had to identify uh, a lot of cat photos. So over 20,000 cat photos, I identified um, over 140 cats, I think. And so I did these camera trap surveys of 100 cam around 100 cameras in each grid. So this is Anya where it's not baited. And I compared that to a site that was baited. And you can, see, you can see the different cats in the different colors, and I could track their movements throughout these camera trapping grids um, to estimate their density, and then the circles show cats I couldn't identify. And so I did this twice in the Glenelg region. Um, so I compared Hotspur to Mount Clay, and then Delp also recently did uh, Low Glenelg National Park surveys as well, so comparing above and below the river. And so what we found was that in, uh, Kabobany and Low Glenelg South, there was between two and three times as many cats as there was compared to um, the associated unbaited site. So this is cat density, cats, number of cats you get for every kilometer squared. And the red site, the red, the red shows the fox sites of fox control and the blue 
uh, the reference sites without Fox control. Um, and then these these lines just show our uncertainty. So if you got if you got a lot of overlap, then you can't be sure. But there there wasn't much overlap. There wasn't any overlap between these two um, sites. So we did see an effect, and we saw an effect. This was strongly correlated with what foxes were doing, like the degree of fox suppression by the poison baiting. So where we saw that 3.7 fold increase in cats was where foxes were really low um, in Lower Benelg and they were also relatively really high in, in the north. Uh, where we didn't see effect was Mount Clay. And this is just because I had to estimate density over this four kilometer buffer zone, which reached into the unbaited farmland. Um, so yeah, it makes sense that cats were reflecting what foxes were doing. Get out of it. Alrighty, and then so in the OA ranges, I got in before Fox Control started. So this site hasn't been baited and this site did get baited, but not in 2017. Uh, I surveyed again in 2018 where there was some baiting in this site. Uh, we've seen just a lot more cats um, here. This is in the wet forests and in 2019 as well, where fox baiting had been occurring for a longer time period. And so what we saw in the site with fox control, cat density slightly increased, whereas in the site without fox control, cat density slightly decreased. And so this just shows the kind of difference between these sites and how confident we are. Confident uh, I am, which is not that confident because we see quite a bit of overlap between the years in these lines, but it's definitely an upwards trajectory of fox control where we have fox control for longer, we are seeing more cats. Um, so it's definitely worth keeping an eye on, uh, I think at least. And again, this was nicely correlated with what fox occurrence was doing spatially. So this was the site with fox control before fox control, and then it started again, um, fox control, and you see that foxes shown by the color are uh, decreasing, whereas they slightly incre they increased in the unbaited site over the same time period which explains like the up and down kind of thing. And so this, this kind of research, this, this part revealed some behavioral changes as well, which I wanted to dive into a bit more. So this is cats across the Otway ranges. And you can see that uh, for each hour of the day that cats are changing their behavior. They have um, different dial activity periods. And so I wanted to know whether they were changing this behavior, this daily behavior based on what foxes were doing. So this is what foxes were doing in terms of the hour of the day. Uh, so mostly nocturnal in the Glenelg region and the Otway Ranges, except for the wet forest, the Otway Ranges. And this is what cats are doing. So when there's not many foxes in the blue, uh, cats are mostly around sunrise and sunset, but where there's heaps of foxes, cats actually flip that, um, that behavior of coming out during the day uh, and early in the morning which is kind of like opposing what foxes are doing. And the same thing was seen in the old ways where cats become more uh, diurnal out during the day. In the wet forest where foxes are pretty much out all the time, they really um, stop using uh, the sunrise time period. And so I'll just wrap up, but I think one of, one of the most surprising things was, was how, how high cat density was in the rainforest of the Otway ranges relative to all the other sites. And foxes were quite low here. And so there is definitely some evidence that fox control increases the density and may, has some behavioral changes for cats. Uh, but we're seeing, you know, definitely strong benefits for potteroos in the Glenelg region. Um, and southern brown bandicoots were really strongly driven by fire. So that's definitely a tool we can kind of use. And so I don't think this is, you know, cause for alarm just yet, but it definitely shows the importance of keeping an eye on what the different species are doing. Um, and yeah, I just want to acknowledge, uh, I did all my food work out in Gunditjmara and Gadabunud country and Parks Victoria and Delp helped me collate um, data from a bit further across Eastern Mark country. Um, yeah, I should just wrap it up there. Thanks very much, Matt. That was, um, that was great. And, uh, you know, um, there's, there'll be a lot of conservationists listening, listening right now. And um, it's a question we've all been wondering for a long time. Um, I guess uh, I can't see any questions in the chat line so far, but I, I had one, um, which other people are probably thinking about is, um, are we wasting our time baiting foxes? Uh, if uh, if we're seeing three times the amount of cats and they're destroying more small mammals or, yeah, what's the what's the solution here? Um, yeah, I definitely don't think we're wasting our time. I think that the, 
fox control at least only looked at two species and for one of those species uh potaroos in the glenelg region like it's pretty much the only thing that's keeping them going and so i would really strongly not suggest to stop that fox baiting i think it's really critical we keep that up um and so i think i only looked at two species and there's obviously a lot of different species that are threatened and important um so i think looking at like some species are more susceptible to foxes some are more to cats some aren't limited by predation they're limited by their habitat and so it just i think to me this research just really shows the importance of the fine scale monitoring and um, looking at who the winners and losers are and the ones that aren't benefiting from fox control maybe we can tailor our fire management um, to, to what suits them a bit more than the other species but that's obviously easier said than done yeah yeah and uh, obviously thinking that way because uh, we're um, still trying to get uh, cat control uh, you know, done effectively across the landscape or um, approved, I guess. So um, looking at those other alternatives is what you're saying. Absolutely. Yeah, it's definitely, and particularly, I think, for bandicoots as well, just that one of the most effective ways I think we can um, protect them against predators is by maintaining that really strong, dense habitat that they need. Um, so yeah, I'm definitely, yeah. Great. Th thanks, Matt. That was, uh, that was fantastic. Um, and uh, yeah, if you've got any um, um, articles or in, in journals or anything else, um, send us a link uh, into the chat box so we can uh, find out more. Absolutely. Thanks very much. Uh, all righty. So uh, now we're going to head over and have a chat with Hamish Martin and Mal Corwell. Um, they're going to be presenting uh, on biodiversity values and our adaptive management approach, um, which is a nice uh, topic to have after um, we've just heard from Matt. So um, welcome, guys. I'll pass over to you. Thanks, Sol. I'll just uh, pull up the screen. So can you see presentation all right? Oh, good. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, uh, my name is Mel Cowell. Um, I'm a biodiversity officer in uh, the Barwon Southwest region. And today, myself and Hamish Martin, our landscape evaluator, are going to give a very brief overview of our uh, forest fire management program, um, how we consider biodiversity values, and how we take an adaptive management approach to what we do. So, the talk will be uh, quite rapid. I'm uh, trying to cover a lot today, but. Um, We've got, first up, we've got an overview of who we are, what we do, and a bit about our adaptive management approach. Um, then we're going to have a closer look in at strategic planning and what we, um, the process that we went through to develop up our bushfire management strategy. Um, and then we're going to hand over to Hamish to talk a bit about our monitoring and evaluation reporting um, projects that are um, driving continuous improvement for our strategy implementation and review. But before I dive in, i um, just like to take the opportunity to um, acknowledge country um, and acknowledge the traditional owners and their elders past and present and emerging um, as the traditional custodians of the land we are all variously meeting on today. And uh, for me, this is traditional lands of the Kuroit Gunditch people here at Tower Hill and across the Barwon Southwest region in which Hamish and I work, uh, the Eastern Ma, Wadarong and Gunditch Ma people. So first off, who we are, what we do, and how does it relate to biodiversity values? Hamish and I are from Forest Fire Management Victoria, made up of DELP, Parks Victoria, Big Forest, and Melbourne Water staff, who are responsible for public land management in Victoria. Um, Hamish and I are part of the Barwon Southwest Risk and Evaluation Team at DELP. Um, our team has a key focus on strategic bushfire management planning, and this supports the far southwest and Otways districts to meet our bushfire management objectives around minimising uh, major impacts of, of bushfires and improving resilience of natural ecosystems, as outlined in our code of practice. Uh, we manage public land for many values, but today we are going to have a focus on how we manage for biodiversity values. And this is, you can see, highlighted in the code objectives um, in yellow. Managed for biodiversity values is um, an ever evolving and complex space though. This is a snapshot of some of the changes that have taken place in the last several years since the publication of the latest review of the Code of the Practice in 2012. And you know, just 
just then um, Matt's talk, um, you know, highlighted the importance of um, that we have to keep that new knowledge and research is always coming in. Um, so yeah, that um, we've had a lot of um, uh, not so positive things over the last few years, like the Black Summer fires, but we've also had some really exciting uh, things like the recent reforms in the Aboriginal self-determination space and cultural fire. And as a, um, these, these all impact how we um, think about managed biodiversity effectively as part of delivery of our program. So to take all of this on board and to still maintain our sanity, uh, we need strong but adaptable frameworks that enable continuous improvement across multiple uh, spatial and temporal scales. And so on the left here is the framework that we use to do um, largely to deliver our bushfire management program. Uh, over the years, uh, the colours and what it looks like has probably changed, um, but the framework itself has remained rel relatively stable and it enables us to stay um, effective and meaningful in, an, in this ever-changing space. So we have uh, three main tiers of planning, strategic, which gives us that long-term vision, operational, which is your medium intent for um, you know, the next few years, and tactical, um, how we are delivering individual activities. Uh, each of these um, three tiers are delivered across an adaptive management cycle, which includes planning, implementation and monitoring, evaluation reporting, and in the centre of this is knowledge and information sharing, like what we're doing today, and community engagement. And we can apply this cycle at both local and landscape scales at, across those different um, tiers of planning. So uh, now I'm going to head in to take a closer look at the strategic planning aspect of the adaptive management cycle. And this is applied at the landscape scale across the Otways and Far Southwest districts um, back in 2013-2015 for Otways and Far Southwest 2017-2019. to 2019. Um, The intent of uh, the, uh, oh, the, um, the process was called um, strategic bushfire risk assessment strategy selection um, and the process was used to produce a long-term vision for how fuel management would be delivered over a 40-year time frame in the far southwest and always landscapes. At the time of this planning, the uh, Safer Together program and DELP's commitment to community first had recently come about. So there was a really big focus on how this planning could bring about meaningful and, um, and a, have a collaborative way that captures everyone's views that are impacted by bushfire and our management. So bushfire management is complex and it can often divide people. So to support coming to a collaborative decision, we undertook a structured decision-making process through a series of workshops involving community, traditional owner and agency representatives. So structured decision-making is a tool to help navigate complex decisions, often involving trade-offs of values. There are six iterative steps to the structured decision-making process, and the next few slides I'll walk you through um, each of these using the far southwest landscape as an example. So the first step of the decision um, of the um, structured decision-making process is to clarify the problem. What's the decision context? We know we have a fire-prone landscape. How, where, and when should we manage bushfire in this landscape? And all of those factors that I talked about earlier, such as, you know, recent uh, crises with um, the environment, new legislation, what is the new knowledge coming in at the time, all kind of comes into this sort of decision context. Next step is to look at the why. What values are driving our decisions around bushfire management? What objectives do we want to achieve and how will we measure them? So here on the slide is the, um, the fundamental values and objectives and metrics that came up as part of the workshops and highlighting yellow are those um, relating to biodiversity values. Third step in the process is developing a range of management alternatives. Um, and so in the far southwest, we, 13 different strategies were developed and each of these had different optimizations for different values. So we have, for example, um, uh, the, the, the strategy on the left is the plantation focus and how, how we can maximize protection. 
on the right is the red tail black cockatoo focus. So how can we maximize protection of those values? Uh, the next step is estimating the consequence. Um, and we ran through thousands of different uh, bushfire simulations over the 40 year time frame and estimated what the consequences were on the things that we valued. For biodiversity values, we estimated how species abundance changed over different parts of the 40 year time frame. This was done mostly using expert derived models of how species respond to fire. Um, but Hamish will talk a bit more about how uh, we are improving on this. And uh, from Matt's talk again today, there's uh, new knowledge in there again that we can also draw on. For the red-tailed black cockatoo, given its iconic status and concerns about impacts of bushfire, we used a more in-depth approach using a population viability analysis to model how each scenario performed. Fourth step uh, was looking at uh, uh, assessing each of those alternatives and undergoing a trade-off process. So the slide here shows uh, the results of the workshop voting which which scenarios were supported and which were opposed from this we were able to take this to refine the um the overall strategy um, on the right and this is showing the number of times each area should be burnt over the next 40 year time frame to give the best outcome for the variety of values that inform this strategy to be selected this leads on to the last stage of imp, um, which is to implement and monitor and it's here that I'd like to reflect on again on one of the first slides I showed. Even in that very short period between developing the strategy and it getting published in 2020, we had a, we had a, very, a lot of changes. We all remember the year of 2020. Some of these were captured as part of the publishing process. However, if you fast forward um, now at the end of 2021, there's many more changes that have come about and new knowledge to take on board. But don't worry, we don't plan to publish a revised strategy every year. Instead, it's about us applying an adaptive management approach to implementation and monitoring. And this builds on and continu continuously improves that strong foundation that we created when we def developed the strategic bushfire plans. And this ensures that our bushfire management program stays relevant to whatever the future may hold. And we can respond effectively to future opportunities, challenges, and new and old ways of working and, not, and thinking, while still maintaining a solid grounding of where we are heading and why. Um, and on that note, I'm going to hand over to Hamish to have a closer look at some of the exciting projects coming out of our monitoring and evaluation program. That's driving um, a lot of continuous improvement Thanks, Mel. Um, and yes, yeah, so you'll probably have to give me a wind up at some stage. I know I'll have to be quick, but um, I guess just uh, going over a few of the things that have really been guiding the MER program, um, like Mel mentioned, we've um, uh, the intents to really improve management. So having good data to build into knowledge is really critical for that. And we've, we've had a pretty long history of having lots of data, but not really being able to use it. Um, hasn't really been in a good format. Um, and so we've got a real focus at the moment about collecting the right data and making sure it's yeah, in a good format to inform decision making. Um, also had a um, focus on partnerships with traditional owners um, and yeah, building some of those um, mutually beneficial sort of outcomes for fire and land management. Um, working with our districts um, as other people on the ground see, see the issues every day and trying to find out what the high priority areas are and things like woody weeds um, or new approaches we're using and trying to learn from that. Um, using remote sensing to get a better understanding at a broader level has been really important and Mark covered that really well in his presentation. Um, and also just our annual sort of getting good fuel hazard data to inform planning and delivery has been a, another key, key focus. Um, so Mel, next slide if you could. Um, and I'll just do a quick, little quick snapshot of a few projects we, we've done recently, just to give a bit of an idea of some of the things you might generate some questions. Um, this project's about collecting fuel accumulation data, and as Mel mentioned, uh, um, strategies really um, underpinned by models. Um, so having the best data to input into fuel accumulation curves is really critical. So we've been out surveying pretty intensively um, woodland heath um, areas as a um, 
focus area and um, using a pretty intensive method to Im improve the data there. Um, we've also purchased some terrestrial LIDAR, which we're um, using to try and improve the, the methods where, where the ecosystem um, allows and speed up the process and have, have a bit better data. And um, Mel, if you go to the next slide, you'll be able to sort of see what, um, what that ends up looking like. It basically develops a point cloud of the system there and that'll get turned into fuel accumulation curves in a really sort of quantitative data way um, and yet reduce some of the intensive methods we're using. Um, and maybe onto the next slide, Mel. Um, like that previous project, um, this one's really about ecological data and we've um, spent the last sort of two or three years um, building up, collecting data, getting it cleaned um, and making it in a format that we can we can really use. Um, it's all consolidated and looking to keep feeding information or data into that. Um, Union Melbourne have also built a a tool for us to, to use um, doing um, species response um, outputs um, so we really get to actually feed sort of real data into our um, strategy decisions now and um, have a bit more of a basis for sort of making some of those trade-off decisions as Mel mentioned. Um, Just a couple of last points if you can Hamish yeah. that'd be great. Okay. Yep, no worries. Um, next project is just um, working with some of our traditional owner groups so I can see some of guys that are on today that have been involved in this um, and essentially yeah, looking to get some of that data from the last project um, to yeah improve some of those species response models and um, yeah, get out on country looking at the how far is going to be impacting on those systems. Um, and Mark covered the um, next project really well so maybe I won't go through that. Um, that's about yeah, remote sensing to make those broad scale decisions and give us triggers to look into when we need to investigate further. Um, and uh, but the last project I was going to touch on was um, basically just identifying areas within the landscape that um, have uh, real value to protect. Um, so that'll again inform our strategies, you know the spots that are those refuges that um, biodiversity retreats to when the system's in stress and making sure we're protecting those. Um, I can cut it there so all and people can ask questions if they Yeah, that sounds uh, sounds good, Hamish. Um, thanks guys. Um, if you've got any questions, there's a, there's a lot in that. Um, so feel free to reach out to Hamish and Mel um, to, to find out more uh, if, if you'd like. Alrighty. Um, We'll keep moving along. Uh, so the last presenter for today is uh, Matt King from uh, Glenelg Hopkins CMA. Uh, welcome, Matt. And um, he'll be um, talking to us about red tails of the Glenelg Plain. So um, over to you. Thanks, Matt. OK. Can you see that? Does that come up yet? Uh, not yet. I might just take a mini. Hang on. Hang on. Just give us a sec. Hang on, yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's uh, come up now. Thanks. Um, I'm getting... I'll just duplicate that if I can, sorry. Okay. Got that one? Yep, you're good to go. Yeah. All right. Yeah, I'm Matt King, uh, Indigenous Partnerships Project Officer for the Glenelg Hopkins CMA. Um, so today I'm talking about red tails of the Glenelg Plain, but mainly from the, the context of uh, some of the collaborative work around uh, cultural burning that's been taking place. So I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which I'm sitting today, which is at Yambuck in southwest Victoria, which is a pretty significant place for the good Inchbarra people. Um, and in addition to today, I just want to acknowledge that we do other collaborative projects through this, um, the Australian government with Wadarong and um, 
other traditional owners around that have got volcanic plains and um, around this space as well. So basically, the overall project is a four-year project um, delivered by us in, in collaboration with other agencies. So you can see that there's a few um, components to it. Ben Zeman manages the overall project, and I just sort of um, get involved in the nuts and bolts. But um, as you can see, there's quite a bit going on in this space. And um, if you want to know more about the red tail itself as a species in detail, you're probably best to to get on the recovery plan or, or Richard Hill, who has been uh, one of the collaborators. So briefly, why the red tail? Why? Um, it's strong cultural importance, Pon Pon Puramu, um, is its name traditionally down this way, um, listed as endangered. And it's reliance obviously on specific food sources, um, including the desert stringy bark, brown stringy bark, etc. The key threats, I guess, are land clearing and the fact that 50% of its habitat's lost. So it sort of puts the pressure on to, to look after its habitat and um, and also fire regimes, bushfire can wipe, wipe out that important food source and um, which is just gonna place more strain on the species. Um, this is just taken from the red tail recovery plan that um, you know, fire is a key threatening process for the red tail and the impact it can have on the canopy. So if, if you do get a large bushfire and it wipes out the canopy, it can be 10 years until, um, until that canopy recovers or those trees recover. So that leads you to the question, why would you burn these areas? Um, so wind is fire, that's the name for fire. Um, so creating a fire history using Aboriginal fire management techniques, in this case, uh, cool, slow mosaic burns with the purpose to protect the food trees from intense wildfire. So wind is being used to solve a modern problem because obviously 50% um, of habitat loss is a modern problem. So it's really fighting fire with fire, but it's the right fire for the right reasons at the right time. Um, this project and yeah, our involvement in it, I'm really privileged to be involved with such great partners. Um, it couldn't happen without Forest Fire Victoria, obviously, and Goodage Mearing. Um, Bereji Gadjian, we're just looking at some sites in the north of the catchment, which could um, possibly be sites for burns. And also, like just like I mentioned, like people like Dane Hendricks, Lee Molseed, and Daniel Deppler from um, Parks. That, and then Aaron Morgan, Ben Church, and Aaron Rose from Goodage Mearing. It's just been a really good team effort. And I think I wanted to place the focus of today a bit around the partnerships in this space, in this biodiversity space, and the importance of not working in silos, but in trying to come together um, with these projects because they're so intertwined. Um, so obviously COVID's been a bit of a factor um, and we've had to take windows of opportunity within lockdowns to get out there and um, experiment with with the fire and, um, and do our field work. So yeah, credit to everyone for their work in that space. Okay, so I'll talk about the first burn. We've, we've done two burns as part of this project so far. This is up at uh, Hurdle Swamp, uh, 10 k's west of Castleton. So it's that heathy, brown stringy bark, grass tree type area with some, can, it, can you see my mouse on this or not? Yep, we can see you pretty Hello. easy yeah. ago. Yeah, yeah, cool. So we went out, when we first surveyed this site, it was pretty funny because Richard was out with us and Dane and I think Dane said, oh, was that a red tail? And I think Richard, if by memory, you said, no, I'll be up around the Grampians at the moment. And then 27 of them flew over our head, which was a pretty unique experience and a good sign we're in the right spot. So I'll talk about Hurdle and Kempbrook Heath, where we've been doing burns. And I guess the fire history from, you know, this is all from, you know, working with Dane and that these areas have got a really um, sort of formidable fire history and that they get um, prone to lightning strikes and due to that heathy country um, and, and they're prone to you know regular fire regular hot fire so these um, canopy trees are under quite a bit of threat 
from bushfire. So our first burn, the, the observations and monitoring. So we don't just go out there and um, light the fire and walk away and that's it. We do pre-burn monitoring with Transex um, and that's a pretty laborious process, but it gives us an idea of um, how the fires are impacting um, the vegetation and, and what sort of uh, structural changes are taking place. So this was at Hurdle Swamp. You could see it was a really cool burn. There was a little impact on the canopy um, and it was just cool enough. We take observations as well, you know, and we, we were, I was just thinking before about Avenza, like which is a really good outcome from today, like how you could um, incorporate a bit more quality of data and observations. So one observation was the, the cool burn, it just released the banks years perfectly. And then in our post burn monitoring, there was evidence of recruitment of Banksia seedlings. So that would be really good to keep an eye on. Um, there's the guys socially distanced at the time. And uh, yeah, it was a really, really good collaborative experience for everyone involved. So the initial findings from Hurdle Swamp, we've still got to crunch a lot of data because we've just been out in the field now that COVID's sort of on its way out and we've done a lot of post burn monitoring here in a Kemprock. But generally it was a patchy burn, low canopy scorch and evidence of recruitment. And it seemed to take out at this stage, but we need to gather more data, the more flammable species. So this burn happened in July, so it was in a very cool time of year. And um, I guess what's, that's what you want maybe leading into summer, that you've got less flammable species in that understory. And definitely um, grass trees have an impact on that too because um, there are a lot of them under the canopy and they burn very hot. Uh, here's a little vid from Hurdle Swamp just to show you the low intensity of the burn. You can see it's just creeping along. Um, there's the canopy and just gives you an idea of the, the general nature of the fire that we're using. It gives animals and insects a chance to, to get away. So Kenbrook Heath, Kabobany, this is another area here. Um, and like, I, I think this is great. Dale Forest Fire set aside around 5,000 hectares for the purpose over the coming years, which will take quite a bit of time to do cool mosaic traditional fire burns throughout the area. And um, Hamish, hopefully I'm talking correctly here, but this is from my understanding, the methodology, I suppose, of, of of what we're doing here. So if you, this is a highly volatile area that burns very hot. And if you were to get a lightning strike, um, and it's fire history is just fairly uniform at the moment. So the, the last fire it had burnt very hot and just boom, you know, wiped out these canopy trees predominantly. So the idea is to do these little, you know, we're not doing massive burns, but mosaic creating a fire history throughout the area so that there is a, if there is a lightning strike, um, you know, we, maybe the biomass under the brown stringy bucks isn't uh, enough to get into the canopy and it holds up um, potential wildfires from destroying the food trees of the red tail. And um, Butch, uh, Goodnich Mearing Rangers have been involved and we did a collaborative day with Rick Millard from uh, Del. And, and we're sharing methodologies about how we can measure this stuff. So it's all very collaborative. And uh, the Goodnich Mearing Rangers got right into it. Um, it was great, you know, it's just really good that we're all coming together for such an in, important species. So you can get the idea of the landscape there. There are small trees and the heathy nature. And um, I guess one of the things too, is when we're doing these surveys, you can come across some interesting finds, which was this, this plant here, which is a blue tinsel lily, doesn't look like a lily. Um, and it's pretty uh, found mainly here and in Southwest WA. It's its only species, I think in uh, in Australia, that Jodie Hayden would probably correct me if I'm wrong there, but a beautiful plant and um, related to the grass tree, which is weird. So Kent Bruck, Kavobni, we did this on the 9th of July. There you can see Jindamara. Um, in there, and you can see how the 
fires just creeping along under that uh, understory there. Um, so the, we've, we've been back for one there. So you can see the patchiness of the burn. It's not burning everything. It's burning very cool. So it's giving um, animals and that a, a chance to get away. There was actually at this very tree on the day, um, to my surprise, a bit of a startle, but there was a copperhead sitting under it after the fire had gone through and it was fine. It just, uh, you know, went away. So it just, it was cool to touch after the, the uh, fire went through. And the initial results are that the minor canopy scorch there that um, has been achieved, um, which is a really good um, indication. So hopefully, um, you know, if we can get more of these burns in, um, it'll protect those trees for the future and create that fire history in the landscape. Uh, just to conclude, I guess the project highlights the importance of partnerships with traditional owners and other agencies to protect this species and the use of wind as a management tool. Uh, yeah, and it needs long term funding, commitment, and monitoring. And um, I think one of the things I'm getting out of it is just the people in the cultural landscape and engaged in the cultural landscape. Um, and I guess in, with the long game in mind, um, you know, particularly with Kent Brook as, a, as, a, as an example, if we can focus on an area like that and, um, you know, get these burns into that landscape to really learn about um, the, the impacts. And I suppose the unfortunate thing is, is you might not see the, the benefits of this work until there is a bushfire and you can come back and go to these areas and go, yeah, we're on the right track here. Um, but yeah, so that sort of um, concludes my presentation. I've probably gone a bit quick. Yeah. Thanks very much, Matt. That was, uh, that was great. No worries. All righty. Um, oh, I'm just getting a bit of feedback there. Um, Matt might just be your um, speaker. Um, thanks very much to all the presenters. Um, I think um, Matt kind of touched on it there at the end. It, um, this biodiversity forum for me today has definitely highlighted the partnerships uh, across the region that we've got and the reliance on partnerships to actually deliver outcomes um, is really important. Um, I was also impressed today by the, uh, the diversity of of work that's happen, happening across uh, across the region, um, not only on the uh, terrestrial landscape, but marine as well, uh, and, and everything in between. Um, so thank you to all the presenters. It's, you know, it's difficult times presenting online, um, and I think you all did a fantastic job. Um, so thanks very much. And, uh, and a final thanks to Louise Falls from Delft as well for coordinating today. It was a huge amount of work, and uh, you've done a fantastic job. Um, Thanks for attending, everybody. Um, there will be a SurveyMonkey uh, link coming out. Um, let us know what you think, and most importantly, let us know what you want to see uh, for the next forum um, when we do have another one. Um, uh, and uh, just a final reminder before you go um, that there will be a session two on Eastern Mar Country on Thursday from uh, 10 to 12 p.m. So um, hope to see you there. Um, thanks, everyone, and we'll uh, catch you later. <laughs>